As for Rome and Moscow— Excuse me, Skipper. Priority from Earth? What now? Norton said to himself. Can't a man get a few minutes to talk to his families? He took the message from the sergeant and scanned it quickly, just to satisfy himself that it was not immediate. Then he read it again, more slowly. What the devil was the Rama Committee? And why had he never heard of it? He knew that all sorts of associations, societies, and professional groups, some serious, some completely crackpot, had been trying to get in touch with him. Mission Control had done a good job of protection, and would not have forwarded this message unless it was considered important. Two hundred kilometer winds. Probably sudden onset. Well, that was something to think about. But it was hard to take it too seriously on this utterly calm night, and it would be ridiculous to run away like frightened mice when they were just starting effective exploration. Norton lifted a hand to brush aside his hair, which had somehow fallen into his eyes again. Then he froze, the gesture uncompleted. He had felt a trace of wind several times in the last hour. It was so slight that he had completely ignored it. After all, he was the commander of a spaceship, not a sailing ship. Until now, the movement of air had not been of the slightest professional concern. What would the long-dead captain of that earlier endeavor have done in a situation such as this? Norton had asked himself that question at every moment of crisis in the last few years. It was his secret, okay, which he had never revealed it. to anyone. And, like most of the important things in life, it had come about quite by accident. He had been captain of the Endeavor for several months before he realized that it was named Read after one of the most famous ships in history. True, during the last four hundred years, there had been a dozen Endeavors of sea and two of space, but the ancestor of them all was the 370-ton Whitby Collier that Captain James Cook, R.N., had sailed around the world between 1768 and 1771. With a mild interest that had quickly turned to an absorbing curiosity, almost an obsession, Norton had begun to read everything he could find about Cook. He was now probably the world's leading authority on the greatest explorer of all time, and knew whole sections of the journals by heart. It still seemed incredible that one man could have done so much with such primitive equipment, but Cook had been not only a supreme navigator, but also a scientist, and, in an age of brutal discipline, a humanitarian. He treated his own men with kindness, which was unusual. What was quite unheard of was that he behaved in exactly the same way to the often hostile savages in the new lands he discovered. It was Norton's left, private dream, which he knew he would never achieve, to retrace at least one of Cook's voyages around the world. Turn he had left. made a limited but spectacular start, which would certainly have astonished the captain, when he once flew a polar orbit directly above the Great Barrier Reef. It had been early morning on a clear day, and from 400 kilometers up, he had had a superb view of that deadly wall of coral, marked by its line of white foam along the Queensland coast. He had taken just under five minutes to travel the whole 2,000 kilometers of the reef. In a single glance, he could span weeks of perilous voyaging for that first endeavor. And through the telescope, he had caught a glimpse of Cooktown and the estuary where the ship had been dragged ashore for repairs after her near-fatal encounter with the reef. A year later, a visit to the Hawaii Deep Space Get Tracking ready. Station right. had given him an even more memorable experience. He had taken the hydrofoil to Kealakekua Bay, 
And as he moved swiftly past the bleak, volcanic right, cliffs, and then he felt right. a depth of emotion that had surprised and even disconcerted him. Turn right. The guide had led his group of scientists, engineers, and astronauts past the glittering metal pylon that had replaced the Turn earlier right. monument, destroyed by the great tsunami of 68. They had walked on for a few more yards across black, nice slippery ride. lava to the small plaque at the water's edge. Little waves were breaking over it, but Norton scarcely noticed them as he bent down to read the words. Near this spot, Captain James Cook was killed, February 14th, 1779. Original tablet dedicated August 18th, 1928, by Cook Sesquicentennial Commission, replaced by Tricentennial Commission, February 14th, 2079. That was years ago, and a hundred million kilometers away. But at moments like this, Cook's reassuring presence seemed very close. In the secret depths of his mind, Norton would up. ask, Well, Captain, what is your advice? It was a little game he played on occasions when there were not enough facts for sound judgment, and one had to rely on intuition. That had been part of Cook's genius. He always made the right choice. Until the end, at Kialakikua Bay. The sergeant waited patiently while his commander stared silently out into the night of Rama. It was no longer unbroken, for at two spots about four kilometers away, the faint patches of light Turn of exploring right. parties could be clearly seen. In an emergency, I can recall them within the hour, Norton told himself. Turn and left. that, surely, should be good enough. He turned to the sergeant. Take this message. Rama Turn Committee, left. care of Planetcom. Appreciate your advice and we'll take precautions. Please specify meaning of phrase, sudden onset. Respectfully, Norton, Commander, Endeavor. He waited until the sergeant had disappeared toward the blazing lights of the camp, then switched on his recorder then again. Turn left. But the train of thought was broken, and he could not get back turn into left. the mood. The letter would have to wait for some other time. It was not often that Captain Cook came to his aid when he was neglecting his duty, but he suddenly remembered how rarely and briefly poor Elizabeth Cook had seen her husband in sixteen years of married life. Yet she had borne him six children and outlived them all. His wives, never more than ten minutes away at the speed of light, had nothing to complain about. 17. Spring During the first nights in Rama, it had not been easy to sleep. The darkness and the mysteries it concealed were oppressive, but even more unsettling was the silence. Absence of noise is not a natural condition. All human senses require some input. If they are deprived of it, the mind manufactures its own substitutes. And so, many sleepers had later complained of strange noises, even of voices, which were obviously illusions, because those awake had heard nothing. Dr. Ernst had prescribed a simple and effective cure. During the sleeping period, the camp was now lulled by gentle, unobtrusive background music. During this night, Norton found the cure inadequate. He kept straining his ears into the darkness, and he knew what he was listening for. But though a faint breeze did caress his face from time to time, there was no sound that could possibly be taken for that of a distant, rising wind. Nor did either of the exploring parties report anything unusual. At last, around ship's midnight, he went to sleep. There was always a man on watch at the communications console, 
In case of any urgent messages, no other precautions seemed necessary. Not even a hurricane could have created the sound that did wake Norton and the whole camp in a single instant. It seemed that the sky was falling, or that Rama had split open and was tearing itself apart. First, there was a rending crack. Then a long, drawn-out series of crystalline crashes, like a million glass houses being demolished. It lasted for minutes, though it seemed like hours. It was still continuing, apparently moving away into the distance, when Norton got to the message center. Hub control, what's happened? Just a moment, Skipper. It's over by the sea. We're getting the light on it. Eight kilometers overhead, on the axis of Rama, the searchlight began to swing its beam out across the plain. It reached the edge of the sea, then started to track along it, scanning around the interior of the world. A quarter of the way around the cylindrical surface, it stopped. Up there in the sky, or what the mind still persisted in calling the sky, something extraordinary was happening. At first, it seemed to Norton that the sea was boiling. It was no longer static and frozen in the grip of an eternal winter. A huge area, kilometers across, was in turbulent movement, and it was changing color. A broad band of white was marching across the ice. Suddenly, a slab, perhaps a quarter of a kilometer on a side, began to tilt upward like an opening door. Slowly and majestically, it reared into the sky, glittering and sparkling in the beam of the searchlight. Then it slid back and vanished beneath the surface, while a tidal wave of foaming water raced outward in all directions from its point of submergence. Not until then did Norton fully realize what was happening. The ice was breaking up. All these days and weeks, the sea had been thawing far down in the depths. It was hard to concentrate because of the crashing roar that still filled the world and echoed around the sky. But he tried to think of a reason for so dramatic a, a convulsion. Room. When a frozen lake or river thawed on Earth, it was nothing like this. But of course, it was obvious enough now that it had happened. The sea was thawing from beneath as the solar heat seeped through the hull of Rama. And when ice turns into water, it occupies less volume. So the sea had been sinking below the upper layer of ice, leaving it unsupported. Day by day, the strain had been building up. Now the bank of ice that encircled the equator of Rama was collapsing, like a bridge that had lost its central pier. It was splintering into hundreds of floating islands, which would crash and jostle into each other until they, too, melted. Norton's blood ran suddenly cold when he remembered the plans that were being made to reach New York by sledge. The tumult was swiftly subsiding. A temporary stalemate had been reached in the war between ice and water. In a few hours, as the temperature continued to rise, the water would win, and the last vestiges of ice would disappear. But in the long run, ice would be the victor, as Rama rounded the sun and set forth once more into the interstellar night. Norton remembered to start breathing again. Then he called the party nearest the sea. To his relief, Rodrigo answered at once. No, the water hadn't reached them. No tidal wave had come sloshing over the edge of the cliff. So now we know, he added calmly, why there is a cliff. Norton agreed silently. But that hardly explains, he thought, why the cliff on the southern shore is ten times higher. The hub searchlight continued to scan around the world, the awakened sea was steadily calming, and the boiling white foam, 
no longer raced outward from capsizing ice flows. In 15 minutes, the main disturbance was over. But Rama was no longer silent. It had awakened from its sleep, and ever and again there came the sound of grinding ice as one berg collided with another. Spring had been a little late, Norton told himself, but winter had ended, and there was that breeze again, stronger than ever. Rama had given him enough warnings. It was time to go. As he neared the halfway mark, Norton once again felt gratitude to the darkness that concealed the view above and below. Though he knew that more than 10,000 steps still lay ahead of him and could picture the steeply ascending curve in his mind's eye, the fact that he could see only a small portion of it made the prospect more bearable. This was his second ascent, and he had learned from his mistakes on the first. The great temptation was to climb too quickly in this low gravity. Every step was so easy that it was hard to adopt a slow, plodding rhythm. But unless one did this, after the first few thousand steps, strange aches developed in the thighs and calves. Muscles that one never knew existed started to protest, and it was necessary to take longer and longer periods of rest. Toward the end of the first climb, Norton had spent more time resting than climbing, and even then, it was not enough. He had suffered painful leg cramps for the next two days, and would have been almost incapacitated had he not been back in the zero-gravity environment of the ship. So this time, he had started with almost painful slowness, moving like an old man. He had been the last to leave the plane, and the others were strung out along the half-kilometer of stairway above him. He could see their lights moving up the invisible slope ahead. He felt sick at heart at the failure of his mission, and even now hoped that this was only a temporary retreat. When they reached the hub, they could wait until any atmospheric disturbances had ceased. Presumably there would be a dead calm there, as at the center of a cyclone, and they could wait out the expected storm in safety. Once again, he was jumping to conclusions, drawing dangerous analogies from Earth. The meteorology of a whole world, even under steady-state conditions, was a matter of enormous complexity. After several centuries of study, terrestrial weather forecasting was still not absolutely reliable. And Rama was not merely a completely novel system. It was also undergoing rapid changes, for the temperature had risen several degrees in the last few hours. Yet there was no sign of the promised hurricane, though there had been a few feeble gusts from apparently random directions. They had now climbed five kilometers, which, in this low and steadily diminishing gravity, was equivalent to less than two on Earth. At the third level, three kilometers from the axis, they rested for an hour, taking light refreshments and massaging leg muscles. This was the last point at which they could breathe in comfort. Like old-time Himalayan mountaineers, they had left their oxygen supplies here and now put them on for the final ascent. An hour later, they had reached the top of the stairway and the beginning of the ladder. Ahead lay the last vertical kilometer, fortunately in a gravity field only a few percent of Earth's. A thirty-minute rest, a careful check of oxygen, and they were ready for the final lap. Norton made sure that all his men were safely ahead of him again, spaced out at twenty-meter intervals along the ladder. From now on, it would be a slow, steady haul, extremely boring. The best technique was to empty the mind of all thoughts and to count the rungs as they drifted by. One hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred. 
He had just reached 1250 when he realized that something was wrong. The light shining on the vertical surface immediately in front of his eyes was the wrong color, and it was much too bright. Norton did not even have time to check his ascent or to call a warning to his men. Everything happened in less than a second. In a soundless concussion of light, dawn burst upon Rama. 18. Dawn. Keep left. The light was so brilliant that for a full minute Norton had to keep his eyes clenched tightly shut. Then he risked opening them and stared through barely parted lids at the wall a few centimeters in front of his face. He blinked several times, waited for the involuntary tears to drain away, and then turned slowly to behold the dawn. He could endure the sight for only a few seconds, then he was forced to close his eyes again. It was not the glare that was intolerable. He could grow accustomed to that. But the awesome spectacle of Rama, now seen for the first time in its entirety. Norton had known exactly what to expect. Nevertheless, the sight had stunned him. He was seized by a spasm of uncontrollable trembling. His hands tightened around the rungs of the ladder with the violence of a drowning man clutching at a life belt. The muscles of his forearms began to knot, yet at the same time his legs, already fatigued by hours of steady climbing, seemed about to give way. If it had not been for the low gravity, he might have fallen. Then his training took over, and he began to apply the first remedy for panic. Still keeping his eyes closed, and trying to forget the monstrous spectacle around him, he started to take deep, long breaths, filling his lungs with oxygen and washing the poisons of fatigue out of his system. Presently, he felt much better but he did not open his eyes until he had performed one more action. It took a major effort of will to force his right hand to open. He had to talk to it as though it were a disobedient child, but presently he maneuvered it down to his waist, unclipped the safety belt from his harness, and hooked the buckle to the nearest rung. Now, whatever happened, he could not fall. He took several more deep breaths, then, still keeping his eyes closed, he switched on his radio. He hoped his voice sounded calm and authoritative as he called, Captain here, is everyone okay? As he checked off the names one by one and received answers, even if somewhat tremulous ones, from everybody. His own confidence and self-control came swiftly back to him. All his men were safe, and were looking to him for leadership. He was the commander once more. Keep your eyes closed until you're quite sure you can take it, he called. The view is overwhelming. If anyone finds that it's too much, keep on climbing without looking back. Remember... You'll soon be at zero gravity, so you can't possibly fall. It was hardly necessary to point out such an elementary fact to trained spacemen, but Norton had to remind himself of it every few seconds. The thought of zero gravity was a kind of talisman, protecting him from harm. Whatever his eyes told him, Rama could not drag him down to destruction on the plain, eight kilometers below. It became an urgent matter of pride and self-esteem that he should open his eyes once more and look at the world around him. But first, he had to get his body under control. He let go of the ladder with both hands and hooked his left arm under a rung. Clenching and unclenching his fists, he waited until the muscle cramps had faded away. When he felt quite comfortable, he opened his eyes and slowly turned to face Rama. 
His first impression was one of blueness. The glare that filled the sky could not have been mistaken for sunlight. It might have been that of an electric arc. So Rama's sun, Norton told himself, must be hotter than ours. That should interest the astronomers. And now he understood the purpose of those mysterious trenches, the straight valley and its five companions. They were nothing less than gigantic strip lights. Rama had six linear suns, symmetrically ranged around its interior. From each, a broad fan of light was aimed across the central axis to shine upon the far side of the world. Norton wondered if they could be switched alternately to produce a cycle of light and darkness, or whether this was a planet of perpetual day. Too much staring at those blinding bars of light had made his eyes hurt again. He was not sorry to have a good excuse to close them for a while. It was not until then, when he had almost recovered from this initial visual shock, that he was able to devote himself to a much more serious problem. Who, or what, had switched on the lights of Rama? By the most sensitive tests that man could apply to it, this world was sterile. But now, something was happening that could not be explained by the action of natural forces. There might not be life here, but there could be consciousness, awareness. Robots might be waking after a sleep of eons. Perhaps this outburst of light was an unprogrammed random spasm, a last dying gasp of machines that were responding wildly to the warmth of a new sun and would soon lapse again into quiescence, this time forever. Yet Norton could not believe such a simple explanation. Bits of the jigsaw puzzle were beginning to fall into place, though many were still missing. The absence of all signs of wear, for example, and the feeling of newness, as if Rama had just been created. They did nothing of the sort. On the contrary, Norton felt a sense of exhilaration, almost of delight. There was far more here to discover than they had ever dared to hope. Wait, he said to himself, until the Rama committee hears about this. Then, with calm determination, he opened his eyes again and began a careful inventory of everything he saw. First, he had to establish some kind of reference system. He was looking at the largest enclosed space ever seen by man, and he needed a mental map to find his way around it. The feeble gravity was little help, for with an effort of will he could switch up and down in any direction he pleased. But some directions were psychologically dangerous. Whenever his mind skirted these, he had to vector it hastily away. Safest of all was to imagine that he was at the bowl-shaped bottom of a gigantic well, sixteen kilometers wide and fifty deep. The advantage of this image was that there could be no danger of falling farther. Nevertheless, it had some serious defects. He could pretend that the scattered towns and cities and the differently colored and textured areas were all securely fixed to the towering walls. The various complex structures that could be seen hanging from the dome overhead were perhaps no more disconcerting than the pendant candelabra in some great concert hall on earth. What was quite unacceptable was the cylindrical sea. There it was, halfway up the well shaft, a band of water, wrapped completely around it with no visible means of support. There could be no doubt that it was water. It was of vivid blue, flecked with brilliant sparkles from the few remaining ice flows, but a vertical sea forming a complete circle twenty kilometers up in the sky was such an unsettling phenomenon that after a while 
he began to seek an alternative. That was when his mind switched the scene through 90 degrees. Instantly, the deep well became a long tunnel, capped at each end. Down was obviously in the direction of the ladder and the stairway he had just ascended, and now, with this perspective, he was at last able to appreciate the true vision of the architects who had built this place. He was clinging to the face of a curving, 16-kilometer-high cliff, the upper half of which overhung completely until it merged into the arched roof of what was now the sky. Beneath him, the ladder descended more than 500 meters until it ended at the first ledge or terrace. There, the stairway began, continuing almost at first in this low-gravity regime, then slowly becoming less and less steep until, after breaking at five more platforms, it reached the distant plain. For the first two or three kilometers, he could see the individual steps, but thereafter they had merged into a continuous band. The downward swoop of that immense stairway was so overwhelming that it was impossible to appreciate its true scale. Norton had once flown around Mount Everest and had been awed by its size. He reminded himself that this stairway was as high as the Himalayas, but the comparison was meaningless. And no comparison at all was possible with the other two stairways, Beta and Gamma, which slanted up into the sky and then curved far out over his head. Norton had now acquired enough confidence to lean back and glance up at them briefly. Then he tried to forget that they were there. Too much thinking along these lines evoked yet a third image of Rama, which he was anxious to avoid at all costs. This was the viewpoint that regarded it once again as a vertical cylinder, or well. But now he was at the top, not the bottom, like a fly crawling upside down on a domed ceiling with a 50-kilometer drop immediately below. Every time he found this image creeping up on him, he needed all his willpower not to cling to the ladder in mindless panic. In time, he was sure, all these fears would ebb. The wonder and strangeness of Rama would banish its terrors, at least for men who were trained to face the realities of space. Perhaps no one who had never left Earth and had never seen the stars all around him could endure these vistas. But if any men could accept them, Norton told himself with grim determination it would be the captain and crew of the Endeavor. He looked at his chronometer. This pause had lasted only two minutes, but it had seemed a lifetime. Exerting barely enough effort to overcome Keep his right. inertia and, then and the right. fading gravitational field, he started to pull himself slowly up the last hundred exit. meters right. of the ladder. Just before he entered the airlock and turned his back upon Rama, he made one final swift survey of the interior. It had changed even in the last few minutes. A mist was rising from the sea. For the first few hundred meters, the ghostly white columns were tilted sharply forward in the direction of Rama's spin. Then they started to dissolve in a swirl of turbulence as the uprushing air tried to jettison its excess velocity. The trade winds of Go this cylindrical up. world were beginning to etch their patterns in its sky. The first tropical storm in unknown ages was about to break. 19. A warning from Mercury. It was the first time in weeks that every member of the Rama committee had made himself available. Professor Solomons had emerged from the depths of the Pacific 
where he had been studying mining operations Keep along right, the mid-ocean trenches. And right. And to nobody's surprise, Dr. Taylor had reappeared. Now that there was at least a possibility that Rama held something more newsworthy right. than lifeless artifacts. The chairman had fully expected Dr. Pereira to be even more dogmatically assertive than usual, now that his prediction of a Raman hurricane had been confirmed. To His Excellency's great surprise, Pereira was remarkably subdued, and accepted the congratulations of his colleagues in a manner as near to embarrassment as he was ever likely to achieve. The exobiologist was, in fact, deeply mortified. The spectacular breakup of the cylindrical sea was a much more obvious phenomenon than the hurricane winds, yet he had completely overlooked it. To have remembered that hot air rises, but to have forgotten that hot ice contracts, was not an achievement of which he could be very proud. However, he would soon get over it and revert to his normal Olympian self-confidence. When the chairman offered him the floor and asked what further climatic changes he expected, he was careful to hedge his bets. You must realize, he explained, that the meteorology of a world as strange as Rama may have many other surprises. But if my calculations are correct, there will be no further storms, and conditions will soon be stable. There will be a slow temperature rise until perihelion and beyond. But that won't concern us, because Endeavour will have had to leave long before then. So, it should soon be safe to go back inside? Uh, probably. We should certainly know in 48 hours. A return is imperative, said the ambassador from Mercury. We have to learn everything we possibly can about Rama. The situation has now changed completely. I think we know what you mean, but would you care to elaborate? Of course. Until now, we have assumed that Rama is lifeless or at any rate uncontrolled. But we can no longer pretend that it is a derelict. Even if there are no life forms aboard, Keep it right. may be directed by robot mechanisms, programmed to carry out some mission, perhaps one highly disadvantageous to us. Unpalatable though it may be, we must consider the question of self-defense. There was a babble of protesting voices and the chairman had to hold up his hand to restore order. Let His Excellency finish, he pleaded. Whether we like the idea or not, it should be considered seriously. With all due respect to the ambassador, said Taylor in his most disrespectful voice, I think we can rule out as naive the fear of malevolent intervention, Creatures as advanced as the Ramans must have correspondingly developed morals. Otherwise, they would have destroyed themselves, as we nearly did in the 20th century. Left, and then I've made that left. quite clear in my new book, Ethos and Cosmos. I hope you received your copy. Yes, thank you. Though I'm afraid turn the left. pressure of other matters has not allowed me to read beyond the introduction. However, I'm familiar with the general thesis. We may have no malevolent intentions toward an ant heap, but if we want to build a house on the same site, this is as bad as the Pandora party. It's nothing less than interstellar xenophobia. Please, gentlemen, this is getting us nowhere. Mr. Ambassador, you still have the floor. The chairman glared across 380,000 kilometers of space at Conrad Taylor, who reluctantly subsided like a volcano biding its time. Thank you, said the ambassador from Mercury. The danger may be unlikely, but where the future of the human race is involved, we can take no chances. And, if I may say so, we Hermians may be particularly concerned. We may have more cause for alarm than anyone else. Taylor snorted audibly, but was quelled by another glare from the moon. Why Mercury, more than any other planet, asked the chairman. Look at the dynamics of the situation. Rama is already inside our orbit. 
It is only Keep an assumption right. that it will go around the right. sun and head on out again into space. Suppose it carries out a braking maneuver. If it does turn so, right. this will be at perihelion, about 30 days from now. My scientists tell me that if the entire velocity change is carried out there, Rama will end up in a circular orbit only 25 million kilometers from the sun. From there, it could dominate the solar system. For a long time, nobody, not even Taylor, spoke a word. All the members of the committee were marshalling their thoughts about those difficult people, the Hermians, so ably represented here by their ambassador. To most people, right, Mercury was a fairly good approximation of hell. At least, it would do until something worse came along. Go straight but the Hermians on. were proud of their bizarre planet, with its days longer than its years, its double sunrises and sunsets, its rivers of molten metal. Let's do By comparison, this. the Moon and Mars had been almost trivial challenges. Right, and Not then until men landed on. on Venus, if Re they ever did, would they encounter an environment more hostile than that Please of Mercury. When possible. And yet, this world had turned out to be, in many ways, the key to the solar system. This seemed obvious in retrospect, but the space age had been almost a century old before the fact was realized. Now, the Hermians never let anyone forget it. Long before men reached the planet, Mercury's abnormal density hinted at the heavy elements it contained. Even so, Finding its wealth was a source of astonishment, and had postponed for a thousand years any fears that the key metals of human civilization would be exhausted. Right. And these treasures right. were in the best possible place, where the power of the sun was ten times greater than on frigid Earth. It's all over unlimited now. energy, unlimited metal, that was mercury. Its great magnetic launchers could catapult manufactured products to any point in the solar system. It could also export energy in synthetic transuranium isotopes or pure radiation. It okay. had even been proposed that go. Hermian lasers would one day thaw out gigantic right. Jupiter. And then continue but this idea on. had not been well received on the other worlds. Go A technology on. that could cook Jupiter had too many tempting possibilities for interplanetary blackmail. That such a concern had ever been expressed said a good deal about the general attitude toward the Hermians. They were respected for their toughness and engineering skills and admired for the way in which they had conquered so fearsome a world. But they were not liked, and still less were they completely trusted. At the same time, it was possible to appreciate their point of view. The Hermians, it was often joked, sometimes behaved as if the sun were their personal property. They were bound to it in an intimate love-hate relationship, as the Vikings had once been linked to the sea, the Nepalese to the Himalayas, the Eskimos to the tundra. They would be most unhappy if something came between them and the natural force that dominated and controlled their lives. At last the chairman broke the long silence. He remembered the son of India and shuddered to contemplate the son of Mercury. So he took the Hermians seriously indeed, even though he considered them uncouth technological barbarians. I think there is some merit in your argument, Mr. Ambassador, he said slowly. Have you any proposals? Yes, sir. Before we know what action to take, we must have the facts. We know the geography of Rama, if one can use that term, but we have no idea of its capabilities. And the key to the whole problem is this. Does Rama have a propulsion system? Can it change orbit? I would be very interested in Dr. Pereira's views. I've given this subject a good deal of thought, answered the exobiologist. Of course, Rama must have been given its original impetus by some launching device, but that could have been an external booster. 
If it does have onboard propulsion, we've found no trace of it. Certainly there are no rocket exhausts or anything similar anywhere on the outer shell. They could be hidden. True, but there would seem little point in it. And where are the propellant tanks, the energy sources? The main hull is solid. We've checked that with seismic surveys. The cavities in the northern cap are all accounted for by the airlock systems. That leaves the southern end of Rama, which Commander Norton has been unable to reach, owing to that 10-kilometer wide band of water. There are all sorts of curious mechanisms and structures up on the South Pole. You've seen the photographs. What they are is anybody's guess. But I'm reasonably sure of this. If Rama does have a propulsion system, it's something completely outside our present knowledge. In fact, it would have to be the fabulous space drive people have been talking about for 200 years. You wouldn't rule that out. Certainly not. Go straight on. If we can prove that Rama has a space drive, even if we learn nothing about its mode of operation, that would be a major discovery. At least we'd know that such a thing is possible. What is a space drive? Asked the ambassador from Earth, rather plaintively. Any kind of propulsion system, Sir Robert, that doesn't work on the rocket principle. Anti-gravity, if it is possible, would do very nicely. At present, we don't know where to look for such a drive, and most scientists doubt it exists. It doesn't, Professor Davidson interjected. Newton settled that. You can't have action without reaction. Space drives are nonsense. Take it from me. You may be right, Pereira replied with unusual blandness. But if Rama doesn't have a space drive, it has no drive at all. There's simply no room for a conventional propulsion system with its enormous fuel tanks. It's hard to imagine a whole world being pushed around, said Solomons. What would happen to the objects inside it? Everything would have to be bolted down. Most inconvenient. Well, the acceleration would probably be very low. The biggest problem would be the water in the cylindrical sea. How would you stop that from... Pereira's voice faded away, and his eyes glazed over. He seemed to be in the throes of incipient epileptic fit, or even a heart attack. His colleagues looked at him in alarm. Then he made a sudden recovery, banged his fist on the table, and shouted, Of course! That explains everything! The southern cliff! Now it makes sense. Not to me, grumbled the lunar ambassador, speaking for all the diplomats present. Look at this longitudinal cross-section of Rama, Pereira continued excitedly, unfolding his map. Have you got your copies? The cylindrical sea is enclosed between two cliffs which completely circle the interior of Rama. The one on the north is only 50 meters high. The southern one, on the other hand, is almost half a kilometer high. Why the big difference? No one's been able to think of a sensible reason. But suppose Rama is able to propel itself, accelerating so that the northern end is forward. The water in the sea would tend to move back. The level at the south would rise, perhaps hundreds of meters, hence the cliff. Let's see. He started scribbling furiously. After an astonishingly short time, it could not have been more than twenty seconds, he looked up in triumph. Knowing the height of those cliffs, we can calculate the maximum acceleration Rama can take. If it was more than two percent of a gravity, the sea would slosh over into the southern continent. A fiftieth of a G? That's not very much. For a mass of 10 million megatons, it is. And it's all you need for astronomical maneuvering. Thank you very much, Dr. Pereira, 
said the Hermian ambassador. You've given us a lot to think about. Mr. Chairman, can we impress on Commander Norton the importance of looking at the South Polar region? He's doing his best. The sea is the obstacle, of course. They're trying to build some kind of raft so that they can at least reach New York. The South Pole may be even more important. Meanwhile, I am going to bring these matters to the attention of the General Assembly. Do I have your approval? There were no objections, not even from Dr. Taylor. But just as the committee members were about to switch out of circuit, Sir Lewis raised his hand. The old historian seldom spoke. When he did, everyone listened. Suppose we do find that Rama is active and has these capabilities. There is an old saying in military affairs that capability does not imply intention. How long should we wait to find what its intentions are? asked the Hermian. When we discover them, it may be far too late. It is already too late. There is nothing we can do to affect Rama. Indeed, I doubt if there ever was. I do not admit that, Sir Lewis. There are many things we can do, if it proves necessary. But the time is desperately short. Rama is a cosmic egg, being warmed by the fires of the sun. It may hatch at any moment. The chairman of the committee looked at the ambassador from Mercury in frank astonishment. He had seldom been so surprised in his diplomatic career. He would never have dreamed that a Hermian was capable of such a poetic flight of imagination. 20. Book of Revelation When one of his crew called him Commander, or, worse still, Mr. Norton, there was always something serious afoot. He could not recall that Boris Rodrigo had ever before addressed him in such a fashion, so this must be doubly serious. Even in normal times, Rodrigo was a grave and sober person. What's the problem, Boris? he asked when the cabin door closed behind them. I'd like permission, Commander to use ship priority for a direct message to Earth. This was unusual, though not unprecedented. Routine signals went to the nearest planetary relay. At the moment, they were working through Mercury. And even though the transit time was only a matter of minutes, it was often five or six hours before a message arrived at the desk Keep of the left, person for whom it was intended. 99% of the time, that was quite good enough. But in an emergency, more direct and much more expensive channels could be employed at the captain's discretion. You know, of course, that you have to give me a good reason. All our available bandwidth is already clogged with data transmission. Is this a personal emergency? No, Commander. It is much more important than that. I want to send a message to the Mother Church. Uh-huh said Norton to himself. How do I handle this? I'd be glad if you'd explain. It was not mere curiosity that prompted Norton's request, though that was certainly present. If he gave Rodrigo the priority he asked, he would have to justify his action. The calm, blue eyes stared into his. He had never known Rodrigo to Long lose around, control we're just your weight on to be other than completely self-assured. All Keep the Cosmo right. Christers were like this. Right. It was one of the benefits of their faith, and it helped to make them good spacemen. Sometimes, turn however, right. their unquestioning certainty was just a little annoying to those Keep unfortunates left. who had not been vouchsafed the revelation. It concerns the purpose of Rama, Commander. I believe I have discovered it. Go on. Look at the situation. Here is a completely empty, lifeless world, yet it is suitable for human beings. It has water and an atmosphere we can breathe. It comes from the remote depths of space. 
aimed precisely at the solar system. Something quite incredible, if it was a matter of pure chance. And it appears not only new, it looks as if it has never been used. We've all been through this dozens of times, Norton thought. What could Rodrigo add to it? Our faith has told us to expect such a visitation, though we do not know exactly what form it will take. The Bible gives hints. If this is not the second coming, it may be the second judgment. The story of Noah describes the first. I believe that Rama is a cosmic ark sent here to save those who are worthy of salvation. There was silence for quite a while in the cabin. It was not that Norton was at a loss for words. Rather, he could think of too many questions, but was not sure which ones it would be tactful to ask. Finally, he remarked, in as mild and non-committal a voice as he could manage, that's a very interesting concept, and though I don't go along with your faith, it's a tantalizingly plausible one. He was not being hypocritical or flattering. Stripped of its religious overtones, Rodrigo's theory was at least as convincing as half a dozen others he had heard. Suppose some catastrophe was about to befall the human race, and a benevolent higher intelligence knew all about it. That would explain everything very neatly. However, there were still a few problems. A couple of questions, Boris. Rama will be at Perihelion in three weeks. Then it will round the sun and leave the solar system just as fast as it came in. There's not much time for a day of judgment or for shipping across those who are, um, selected. However, that's going to be done. Very true. So when it reaches Perihelion, so Rama will have to decelerate and go into a parking orbit, probably one with aphelion at Earth's orbit. There it might make another velocity change and rendezvous with Earth. This was disturbingly persuasive. If Rama wished to remain in the solar system, it was going the right way about it. The most efficient way to slow down was to get as close to the sun as possible and carry out the braking maneuver there. Go straight if there up. was any truth in Rodrigo's theory, or some variant of it, it would soon be put to the test. One other point, Boris. What's controlling Rama now? There is no doctrine to advise on that. It could be a pure robot or it could be a spirit. That would explain why there are no signs of biological life forms. The haunted asteroid. Why had that phrase popped up from the depths of memory? Then he recalled a silly story he had read years ago, but thought it best not to ask Rodrigo if he had ever seen it. He doubted if the other's tastes ran to that sort of reading. I'll tell you what we'll do, Boris, he said, abruptly making up his mind. He wanted to terminate this interview before it got too difficult, and thought he had found a good compromise. Can you sum up your ideas in less than, oh, a thousand bits? Yes, I think so. Well, if you can make it sound like a straightforward scientific theory, I'll send it top priority to the Rama Committee. Then a copy can go to your church at the same time, and everyone will be happy. Thank you, Commander. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm not doing this to save my conscience. I'd just like to see what the committee makes of it. Even if I don't agree with you all along the line, you may have hit on something important. Well, we'll know at Perihelion, won't we? Yes, we'll know at Perihelion. When Rodrigo had left, Norton called the bridge and gave the necessary authorization. He thought he had solved the problem rather neatly. Besides, just suppose that Rodrigo was right. He might have increased his chances, 
of being among the saved. Twenty one. After the storm. As they drifted along the now familiar corridor of the Alpha Airlock complex, Norton wondered if they had let impatience overcome caution. They had waited aboard Endeavour for 48 hours, two precious days, ready for instant departure if events should justify it. But nothing had happened. The instruments left in Rama had detected no unusual activity. Frustratingly, the television camera on the hub had been blinded by a fog that had reduced visibility to a few meters and had only now started to retreat. When they operated the final airlock door right, and floated out and into the cat's right. cradle of guide ropes around the hub, Norton was turn struck right. first by the change in the light. It was no longer Keep harshly left. blue, but was much more mellow and gentle, reminding him of a bright, hazy day on Earth. He looked outward along the axis of the world and could see nothing except a glowing, featureless tunnel of white reaching all the way to those strange mountains at the South Pole. The interior of Rama was completely blanketed by clouds, and nowhere was a break visible in the overcast. The top of the layer was quite sharply defined. It formed a smaller cylinder inside the larger one of this spinning world, leaving a central core, five or six kilometers wide, quite clear, except for a few stray wisps of cirrus. The immense tube of cloud was lit from within by the six artificial suns of Rama. The locations of the three on this northern continent were clearly defined by diffuse strips of light, but those on the far side of the cylindrical sea merged together into a continuous glowing band. What is happening down beneath those clouds? Norton asked himself, but at least the storm, which had centrifuged them into such perfect symmetry about the axis of Rama, had now died away. Go straight on. Unless there were some other surprises, it would be safe to descend. It seemed appropriate, on this return visit, to use the team that had made the first deep penetration into Rama. Sergeant Myron, like every other member of Endeavour's crew, now fully met Surgeon Commander Ernst's physical requirements. He even maintained, with convincing sincerity, that he was never going to wear his old uniforms again. As Norton watched Mercer, Calvert, and Myron swimming quickly and confidently down the ladder, he reminded himself how much had changed. That first time, they had descended in cold and darkness. Now they were going toward light and warmth. And on all earlier visits, they had been certain that Rama was dead. That might yet be true, in a biological sense. But something was stirring, and Boris Rodrigo's word would do as well as any other. The spirit of Rama was awake. When they had reached the platform at the foot of the ladder and were preparing to start down the stairway, Mercer carried out his usual routine test of the atmosphere. There were some things that he never took for granted, even when the people around him were breathing perfectly comfortably, without aids. He had been known to stop for an air check before opening his helmet. When asked to justify such excessive caution, he had answered, because human senses aren't good enough, that's why. You may think you're fine, but you could fall flat on your face with the next deep breath. Keep left. He looked at his meter and said, Damn. What's the trouble? asked Calvert. It's broken, reading too high. Odd. I've never known that to happen before. I'll check it on my breathing circuit. He plugged the compact little analyzer into the test point of his oxygen supply, then stood in thoughtful silence for a while. 
His companions looked at him with anxious concern. Anything that upset Mercer was to be taken seriously indeed. He unplugged the meter, used it to sample the Rama atmosphere again, then called Hub Control. Skipper, will you take an O2 reading? There was a much longer pause than the request justified. Then Norton radioed back, I think there's something wrong with my meter. A slow smile spread across Mercer's face. It's up 50%, isn't it? Yes. What does that mean? It means that we can all take off our masks. Isn't that convenient? I'm not sure, replied Norton, echoing the sarcasm in Mercer's voice. It seems too good to be true. There was no need to say any more. Like all spacemen, Norton had a profound suspicion of things that were too good to be true. Mercer cracked his mask open a trifle and took a cautious sniff. For the first time at this altitude, the air was perfectly breathable. The musty, dead smell had gone. So had the excessive dryness, which in the past had caused several respiratory complaints. Humidity was now an astonishing 80%. Doubtless the thawing of the sea was responsible for this. There was a muggy feeling in the air, though not an unpleasant one. It was like a summer evening, Mercer thought, Keep on some tropical coast. The climate inside Rama had improved dramatically during the last few days. And why? The increased humidity was no problem. The startling rise in oxygen was much more difficult to explain. As he recommenced the descent, Mercer began a whole series of mental calculations. He had not arrived at any satisfactory result by the time they entered the cloud layer. It was a dramatic experience, for the transition was abrupt. At one moment, they were sliding downward in clear air, gripping the smooth metal of the handrail right, so that they would not gain speed right. too swiftly in this quarter of a gravity region. Then, suddenly, they shot turn into right. a blinding white fog, and visibility dropped to a few meters. Mercer put on the brakes so quickly that Calvert almost bumped into him, and Myron did bump into Calvert, nearly knocking him off the rail. Take it easy, said Mercer. Spread out so we can just see each other. And don't let yourself build up speed, in case I have to stop suddenly. In eerie silence, they continued to glide downward through the fog. Calvert could just see Mercer as a vague shadow ten meters ahead. And when he looked back, Myron was at the same distance behind him. In some ways... This was even spookier than descending in the complete darkness of the Raman night. Then, at least, the searchlight beams had shown them what lay ahead. But this was like diving in poor visibility in the open sea. It was impossible to tell how far they had traveled, but Calvert guessed they had almost reached the fourth level when Mercer suddenly braked again. After they had bunched together, he whispered, Listen, don't you hear something? Yes, said Myron after a minute. It sounds like the wind. Calvert was not so sure. He turned his head back and forth, trying to locate the direction of the faint murmur that had come to them through the fog, but soon abandoned the attempt as hopeless. They continued the slide, reached the fourth level, and started on toward the fifth. All the while the sound grew louder and more hauntingly familiar. They were halfway down the fourth stairway when Myron called out, Now do you recognize it? They should have identified it long ago, but it was not a sound they would ever have associated with any world except Earth. Coming out of the fog, from a source whose distance could not be guessed was the steady Keep thunder right, of falling water. Right. A few minutes later, the cloud ceiling ended 
as abruptly as it had begun. They shot out into the blinding Excellent. glare of the right. Raman day, made more brilliant by the light reflected from the low-hanging clouds. There was the familiar curving plane, now made more Turn acceptable right. to mind and senses because its full circle could no longer be seen. It was not too difficult to pretend that they were looking along a broad valley and that the upward sweep of the sea was really an outward one. They halted at the fifth and penultimate platform to report that they were through the cloud cover and to make a careful survey. As far as they could tell, nothing had changed down there on the plain, but up here on the northern dome, Rama had brought forth another wonder. So there was the origin of the sound they had heard. Descending from some hidden source in the clouds three or four kilometers away was a waterfall, and for long minutes they stared at it silently, almost unable to believe their eyes. Logic told them that on this spinning world no falling object could move in a straight line, but there was something horribly unnatural about a curving waterfall that curved sideways, to end many kilometers away from the point directly below its source. If Galileo had been born in this world, said Mercer finally, he'd have gone crazy working out the laws of dynamics. I thought I knew them, Calvert replied, and I'm going crazy anyway. Doesn't it upset you, Prof? Why should it, said Myron. It's a perfectly straightforward demonstration of the Coriolis effect. I wish I could show it to some of my students. Mercer was staring thoughtfully at the globe-circling band of the cylindrical sea. Have you noticed what's happened to the water? He said at last. Why, it's no longer so blue. I'd call it pea-green. What does that signify? Perhaps the same thing that it does on Earth. Laura called the sea an organic soup, waiting to be shaken into life. Maybe that's exactly what's happened. In a couple of days? It took millions of years on Earth. 375 million, according to the latest estimate. So that's where the oxygens come from. Rama's shot through the anaerobic stage and has got to photosynthetic plants in about 48 hours. I wonder what it will produce tomorrow. 22. To sail the cylindrical sea. When they reached the foot of the stairway, they had another shock. At first it appeared that something had gone through the camp, overturning equipment, even collecting smaller objects and carrying them away. But after a brief examination, their alarm was replaced by a rather shamefaced annoyance. The culprit was only the wind. Though they had tied down all loose objects before they left, some ropes must have parted during exceptionally strong gusts. It was several days before they were able to retrieve all their scattered property. Otherwise there seemed no major changes. Even the silence of Rama had returned, now that the ephemeral storms of spring were over. And out there at the edge of the plain was a calm sea, waiting for the first ship in a million years. Shouldn't one christen a new boat with a bottle of champagne? Even if we had some on board, I wouldn't allow such a criminal waste. Anyway, it's too late. We've already launched the thing. At least it does float. You've won your bet, Jimmy. I'll settle when we get back to Earth. It's got to have a name. Any ideas? The subject of these unflattering comments was now bobbing beside the steps leading down into the cylindrical sea. It was a small raft, constructed from six empty storage drums, held together by a light metal framework, building it, assembling it at Camp Alpha, and hauling it on demountable wheels across more than ten kilometers of plain, 
had absorbed the crew's entire energies for several days. It was a gamble that had better pay off. The prize was worth the risk. The enigmatic towers of New York, gleaming there in the shadowless light five kilometers away, had taunted them ever since they had entered Rama. No one doubted that the city, or whatever it might be, was the real heart of this world. If they did nothing else, they must reach New York. We still don't have a name. Skipper, what about it? Norton laughed, then became suddenly serious. I've got one for you. Call it Resolution. Why? That was one of Cook's ships. It's a good name. May she live up to it. There was a thoughtful silence. Then Sergeant Barnes, who had been principally responsible for the design, asked for three volunteers. Everyone present held up a hand. Sorry, we have only four life jackets. Boris, Jimmy, Peter. You've all done some sailing. Let's try her out. No one thought it in the least peculiar that an executive sergeant was now taking charge of the proceedings. Ruby Barnes had the only master's certificate aboard, so that settled the matter. She had navigated racing trimarans across the Pacific, and it did not seem likely that a few kilometers of dead calm water would present much of a challenge to her skills. Ever since she had set eyes upon the sea, she had been determined to make this voyage. In all the thousands of years that man had had dealings with the waters of his own world, no sailor had ever faced anything remotely like this. In the last few days, a silly little jingle had been running through her mind, and she could not get rid of it. To sail the cylindrical sea, well, that was precisely what she was going to do. Her passengers took their places on the improvised bucket seats, and Ruby opened the throttle. The 20-kilowatt motor started to whir. The chain drives of the reduction gear blurred, and resolution surged away to the cheers of the spectators. To turn right. Ruby had hoped to get 15 kph with this load, but would settle for anything over 10. A half-kilometer right. course had been measured along the cliff, and she made the round trip in five and a half minutes. Allowing for turning time, this worked out at 12 kph, and she was quite happy with that. With no power, but with three energetic paddlers helping her own more skillful Keep blade, right. Ruby was able to right. get a quarter of this speed. So even if the motor broke down, they could get exit. back to shore right. in a couple of hours. The heavy-duty power cells could provide enough energy to circumnavigate the world, but she was carrying two spares to be on the safe side. And now that the fog had completely burned away, even such a cautious right. mariner as Ruby was prepared to put to sea without turn a compass. Right. She saluted smartly as she stepped ashore. Maiden voyage of resolution successfully completed, sir. Now awaiting your instructions. Here we are. Very Safe good, Admiral. When will you be ready to sail? As soon as stores can be loaded aboard and the harbor master gives us clearance. Then we leave at dawn. Aye, aye, sir. Five kilometers of water does not seem much on a map. It is very different when one is in the middle of it. They had been cruising for only ten minutes, and the fifty-meter cliff facing the northern continent already seemed a surprising distance away. Yet, mysteriously, New York appeared hardly much closer than before. Most of the time they paid little attention to the land. They were still too engrossed in the wonder of the sea. They no longer made the nervous jokes that had punctuated the start of the voyage. This new experience was too overwhelming. Every time... Norton said to himself, I feel that I've grown accustomed to Rama. It produces some new wonder. As resolution hummed steadily forward, it seemed again and again that they were caught in the trough of a gigantic wave, 
a wave that curved up on either side until it became vertical, then overhung until the two flanks met in a liquid arch sixteen kilometers above their heads. Despite everything that reason and logic told them, none of the voyagers could for long throw off the impression that at any minute those millions of tons of water would come crashing down from the sky. Yet, despite this, their main feeling was one of exhilaration. There was a sense of danger, without any real danger. Unless, of course, the sea itself produced more surprises. Ready to that was a distinct possibility, for, as Mercer had guessed, the water was now alive. Every spoonful contained thousands of spherical, single-celled microorganisms, similar to the earliest forms of plankton that had existed in the oceans of Earth. Yet they showed puzzling differences. They lacked a nucleus, as well as many of the other minimum requirements of even the most primitive terrestrial life forms. And although Laura Ernst, now doubling as research scientist and ship's doctor, had proved that they definitely generated oxygen, there were far too few of them to account for the augmentation of Rama's atmosphere. They should have existed in billions, not mere thousands. Then Ten. she discovered that their numbers were dwindling rapidly and must have been far higher during the first hours of the Raman dawn. It was as if there had been a brief explosion of life, recapitulating on a trillion-fold swifter time scale the early history of Earth. Now, Ten. perhaps, it had exhausted itself. The drifting microorganisms were disintegrating, releasing their stores of chemicals back into the sea. If you have to swim for it, Dr. Ernst had warned the mariners, keep your mouths closed. A few drops won't matter if you spit them out right away. But all those weird organometallic salts add up to a fairly poisonous package, and I'd hate to have to work out an antidote. This danger, fortunately, seemed unlikely. Resolution could stay afloat if any two of her buoyancy tanks were punctured. When told Go of this, Calvert had muttered darkly, Remember the Titanic. And even if she sank, the crude but efficient life jackets would keep their heads above water. Although Dr. Ernst had been reluctant to give a firm ruling on this, she did not think that a few hours' immersion in the sea would be fatal, but she did not recommend it. After twenty minutes of steady progress, New York was no longer a distant island. It was becoming a real place, and details they had seen only through telescopes and photo enlargements were now revealing themselves as massive, solid structures. It was now strikingly apparent that the city, like so much of Rama, was triplicated. It consisted of three identical circular complexes or superstructures rising from a long oval foundation. Photographs taken from the hub had also indicated that each complex was itself divided into three equal components, like a pie sliced into 120 degree portions. This would greatly simplify the task of exploration. Presumably they had to examine only one-ninth of New York to see the whole of it. Even this would be a formidable undertaking. It would mean investigating at least a square kilometer of buildings and machinery, some of which towered hundreds of meters into the air. The Ramans, it seemed, had brought the art of triple redundancy to a high degree of perfection. This was demonstrated in the airlock system, the stairways at the hub, the artificial suns. And where it really mattered, they had even taken the next step. New York appeared to be an example of triple-triple redundancy. Ruby was steering resolution toward the central complex, where a flight of steps led up from the water to the top of the wall, or levee, that surrounded the island. 
There was even a conveniently on. placed mooring post to which boats could be tied. When she saw this, Ruby became quite excited. Now, she would never be content until she found one of the craft in which the Ramans sailed their extraordinary sea. Norton was the first to step ashore. He looked back at his three companions and said, Wait here on the boat until I get to the top of the wall. When I wave, Peter and Boris will join me. You stay at the helm, Ruby, so that we can cast off at a moment's notice. If anything happens to me, report to Carl and follow his instructions. Use your best judgment, but no heroics. Understood? Yes, Skipper. Good luck. Commander Norton did not really believe in luck. He never got into a situation until he had analyzed all the factors involved and had secured his line of retreat. But once again, Rama was forcing him to break some of his cherished rules. Almost every factor here was unknown, as unknown as the Pacific and the Great Barrier Reef had been to his hero three and a half centuries ago. Yes, he could do with all the luck that happened to be lying around. The stairway was a virtual duplicate of the one they had descended on the other side of the sea, where, doubtless, his friends were looking straight across at him through their telescopes. And straight was now the correct word. In this one direction, parallel to the axis of Rama, the sea was indeed completely flat. It might well be the only body of water in the universe of which this was true. For on all other worlds, every sea and lake must follow the surface of a sphere with equal curvature in all directions. Nearly at the top, he reported, speaking for the record and for his intently listening second in command, five kilometers away. Still completely quiet, Radiation normal. I'm holding the meter above my head, just in case this wall is acting as a shield for anything. And if there are any hostiles on the other side, they'll shoot that first. He was joking, of course. And yet, why take any chances, when it was just as easy to avoid them? When he took the last step, he found that the flat-topped embankment was about ten meters thick. On the inner side, an alternating series of ramps and stairways led down to the main level of the city, twenty meters below. In effect, he was standing on a high wall, which completely surrounded New York, and so was able to get a grandstand view of it. It was a view almost stunning in its complexity, and his first act was to make a slow panoramic scan with his camera. Then he waved to his companions and radioed back across the sea. No sign of any activity. Everything quiet. Come on up. We'll start exploring. 23. N.Y. Rama. It was not a city. It was a machine. Norton had come to that conclusion in ten minutes, and saw no reason to change it after they had made a complete traverse of Go the island. On. A city, whatever the nature of its occupants, surely had to provide some form of accommodation. There was nothing here of that nature, unless it was underground. Keep and if that was the case, where were the entrances, the stairways, the elevators? He had not found anything that even qualified as a simple door. The closest analogy to this place that he had ever seen on Earth was a giant chemical processing plant. However, there were no stockpiles of raw materials or any indications of a transport system to move them around. Nor could he imagine where the finished product would emerge, still less what that product could possibly be. It was all very baffling, Keep and right, more than a little and then frustrating. Right. Anybody care to make a guess? He said at last, to all who might exit. be listening. Right. If this is a factory, what does it make? 
And where does it get its raw materials? I have a suggestion, Skipper, said Mercer, over on the far shore. Suppose it uses the sea. According to Doc, that contains just about anything you can think of. It was a plausible answer, and Norton had already considered it. There could it well be on. buried pipes leading to the sea. In fact, there must be, for any conceivable chemical plant would require large quantities of water. But he had a suspicion of plausible answers. They were so often wrong. That's a good idea, Kyle. But what does New York do with its seawater? For a long time, nobody answered from ship, hub, or northern plain. Then an unexpected voice spoke. That's easy, Skipper, but you're all going to laugh at me. No, we're not, Robbie. Are you ahead. dumb, stupid, or stupid? Robbie McAndrews, chief steward and simp master, was the last person on the endeavor who would normally get involved in a technical discussion. His IQ was modest, and his scientific knowledge was minimal, but he was no fool, and he had a natural shrewdness that everyone respected. Well, it's a factory, all right, Skipper, and maybe the sea provides the raw material. After all, that's how it all happened on Earth, though in a different way. I believe New York is a factory for making... Ramens. Somebody, somewhere, snickered, but became quickly silent and did not identify himself. You know, Ravi, said his commander at last, that theory is crazy enough to be true, and I'm not sure if I want to see it tested, at least until I get back to the mainland. This celestial New York was just about as wide as the island of Manhattan, but its geometry was totally different. There were few straight thoroughfares. It was a maze of short, concentric arcs, with radial spokes linking them. Luckily, it was impossible to lose one's bearings inside Rama. A single glance at the sky was enough to establish the north-south axis of the world. They paused at almost every intersection to make a panoramic scan. When all these hundreds of pictures were sorted out, it would be a tedious but fairly straightforward job to construct an accurate scale model of the city. Norton suspected that the resulting jigsaw puzzle would keep scientists busy for generations. What's up, talkers? It was even harder to get used to the silence song. here than it had been out on the plain of Rama. A city machine should make some sound yet there was not even the faintest of electric hums or the slightest whisper of mechanical motion. Several times Norton put his ear to the ground or to the side of a building and listened intently. He could hear nothing except the pounding of his own blood. The machines Go were sleeping. Up. They were not even ticking over. Would they ever wake again? And for what purpose? Everything was in perfect condition, as usual. It was easy to believe that the closing of a single circuit in some patient, hidden computer would bring all this maze back to life. When at last they had reached the far side of the city, they climbed to the top of the surrounding levee and looked across the southern branch of the sea. For a long time, Norton stared at the 500-meter cliff that barred them from almost half of Rama. And, judging from their telescopic surveys, the most complex and varied half. From this angle, it appeared an ominous, forbidding black, and it was easy to think of it as a prison wall surrounding a whole continent. Nowhere along its entire circle were there stairways, or any other means of access. He wondered how the Ramans reached their southern land from New York. Probably there was a transport system running beneath the sea, but they must also have aircraft because there were many open areas here in the city that could be used for landing. To discover a Raman vehicle would be a major accomplishment, 
especially if they could learn to operate it. Though could any conceivable power source still be functioning after several hundred thousand years? There were numerous structures that had the functional look of hangars or garages, but they were all smooth and windowless, as if they had been sprayed with sealer. Sooner or later, Norton told himself grimly, we'll be forced to use explosives and laser beams. He was determined to put off this decision to the last possible moment. His reluctance to use brute force was based partly on pride, partly on fear. He did not wish to behave like a technological barbarian, smashing what he could not understand. After all, he was an uninvited visitor in this world and should act Keep right accordingly. And then exit right. As for his fear, perhaps that was too strong a word. Apprehension exit might be better. Right. The Ramans seemed to have planned for everything. He was not anxious to discover the precautions they had taken to guard their property. When he sailed back to the mainland, it would be with empty hands. 24. Dragonfly Lieutenant James Pack was the most junior officer on board Endeavour, and this was only his fourth mission into deep space. He was ambitious and due for promotion. Right, and then he had also right. committed a serious breach of regulations. No wonder, therefore, that he took a long time to make up his exit. mind. Right. It would be a gamble. If he lost, he could be in deep trouble. He would not only be risking his career, Turn he left. might even be risking his neck. But if he succeeded, he would be a hero. What finally convinced him was neither of these arguments. It was the certainty that if he did nothing at all, he would spend the rest of his life brooding over his Turn lost right. opportunity. Nevertheless, he was still hesitant when he asked Commander Norton for a private meeting. What is it this time? Norton asked himself as he analyzed the uncertain expression on the young officer's face. He remembered his delicate interview with Boris Rodrigo. No, it wouldn't be anything like that. Pack was certainly not the religious type. The only interests he had ever shown outside his work were sport and sex, preferably combined. It could hardly be the former, and Norton hoped it was not the latter. He had encountered most of the problems that a commanding officer could encounter in this department, except the classical one of an unscheduled berth during a mission. Though this situation was the subject of innumerable jokes, it had never happened yet, but such gross incompetence was probably only a matter of time. Well, Jimmy, what is it? I have an idea, Commander. I know how to reach the southern continent, even the South Pole. I'm listening. How do you propose to do it? Uh, by flying there. Jimmy, I've had at least five proposals to do that. More, if you count crazy suggestions from Earth. We've looked into the possibility of adapting our spacesuit propulsors but air drag would make them hopelessly inefficient. They'd run out of fuel before they could go ten kilometers. I know that, but I have the answer. Pack's attitude was a curious mixture of complete confidence and barely suppressed nervousness. Norton was quite baffled. What was the kid worried about? Surely he knew his commanding officer well enough to be certain that no reasonable proposal would be laughed out of court. Well, go on. If it works, I'll see your promotion is retroactive. That little half-promise, half-joke didn't go down as well as he had hoped. Jimmy gave a rather sickly smile, made several false starts then decided on an oblique approach when to the subject. Possible. 
Make a U-turn. You know, Commander, that I was in the Lunar Olympics last year. Of course. Sorry you didn't we win. Went. It was bad equipment. I know what went wrong. I have friends on Mars who've been working on it in secret. We want to give everyone a surprise. Mars? But I didn't know. Not many people do. The sport's still new there. It's only been tried in the Xanti Sports Dome. But the best aerodynamicists in the solar system are on Mars. If you can fly in that atmosphere, you can fly anywhere. Now, my idea was that if the Martians could build a good machine with all their know-how, it would really perform on the moon, where gravity is only half as strong. That seems plausible, but how does it help us? Norton was beginning to guess, but he wanted to give Jimmy plenty of rope. Well, I formed a syndicate with some friends in Port Lowell. They've built a fully aerobatic flyer with some refinements that no one has ever seen before. In lunar gravity, under the Olympic Dome, it should create a sensation and win you the gold medal. I hope so. Let me see if I follow your train of thought correctly. A sky bike that could enter the Lunar Olympics at a sixth of a gravity would be even more sensational inside Rama, with no gravity at all. You could fly it right along the axis, from the North Pole to the South and back again. Yes, easily. The one-way trip would take three hours non-stop. But, of course, you could rest whenever you wanted to, as long as you kept near the axis. It's a brilliant idea, and I congratulate you. What a pity sky bikes aren't part of regular space survey equipment. Jimmy seemed to have some difficulty in finding words. He opened his mouth several times, but nothing happened. All right, Jimmy. As a matter of morbid interest and purely off the record, the how did exit. you smuggle the thing aboard? Uh, exit recreational now. stores? Well, you weren't lying. And what about the weight? It's only 20 kilograms. Only? Still, it's not as bad as I thought. In fact, I'm astonished you can build a bike at that weight. Some have been only 15, but they were too fragile and usually folded up when they made a turn. There's no danger of Dragonfly doing that. As I said, she's fully aerobatic. Dragonfly. Nice name. So tell me just how you plan to use her. Then I can decide whether a promotion or a court-martial is in order, or both. 25. Maiden Flight Dragonfly was certainly a good name. The long, tapering wings were almost invisible, except when the light struck them from certain angles and was refracted into rainbow hues. It was as if a soap bubble had been wrapped around a delicate tracery of aerofoil sections. The envelope enclosing the little flyer was an organic film, only a few molecules thick, yet strong enough to control and direct the movements of a 50 kilometer per hour airflow. The pilot, who was also the power plant and the guidance system, sat on a tiny seat at the center of gravity in a semi-reclining position to reduce air resistance. Control was by a single stick, which could be moved backward and forward, right and left. The only instrument was a piece of weighted ribbon attached to the leading edge to show the direction of the relative wind. Once the flyer had been assembled at the hub, Jimmy Pack would allow no one to touch it. Clumsy handling could snap one of the single fiber structural members, and those glittering wings were an almost irresistible attraction to prying fingers. It was hard to believe that there was really something there. As he watched Jimmy climb into the contraption, Norton began to have second thoughts. If one of those wire-sized struts snapped when Dragonfly was on the other side of the cylindrical sea, Jimmy would have no way of getting back, even if he was able to make a safe landing. 
they were also breaking one of the most sacrosanct rules of space exploration. A man was going alone into unknown territory, beyond all possibility of help. The only consolation was that he would be in full view and communication all the time. If he did meet with disaster, they would know exactly what had happened to him. Yet this opportunity was far too good to miss. If one believed in fate or destiny, it would be challenging the gods themselves to neglect the only chance they might ever have of reaching the far side of Rama and seeing at close quarters the mysteries of the South Pole. Jimmy knew what he was attempting, far better than anyone in the crew could tell him. This was precisely the sort of risk that had to be taken. If it failed, that was the luck of the game. You couldn't win them all. Now listen to me carefully, Jimmy, said Laura Ernst. It's very important not to overexert yourself. Remember, the oxygen level here at the Axis is still very low. If you feel breathless at any time, stop and hyperventilate for 30 seconds, but no longer. Go Jimmy up. nodded absentmindedly as he tested the controls. The whole rudder elevator assembly, which formed a single unit on an outrigger five meters behind the rudimentary cockpit, began to twist around. Then the flap-shaped ailerons, halfway along the wing, moved alternately up and down. Do you want me to swing the prop? asked Joe Calvert, unable to repress memories of 200-year-old war movies. Ignition, contact. Probably no one except Jimmy knew what he was talking about, but it helped to relieve the tension. Very slowly, Jimmy started to move the foot pedals. The flimsy, broad fan of the airscrew, like the wing, a delicate skeleton covered with shimmering film, began to turn. By the time it had made a few revolutions, it had disappeared completely, and Dragonfly was on her way. She lifted straight upward, or outward, from the hub, moving slowly along the axis of Rama. When she had traveled a hundred meters, Jimmy stopped pedaling. It was strange to see an obviously aerodynamic vehicle hanging motionless in mid-air. This must be the first time such a thing had ever happened, except possibly on a limited scale inside one of the larger space stations. How does she handle? Norton called. Response good, stability poor. But I know what the trouble is, no gravity. We'll be better off a kilometer lower down. Now, wait a minute. Is that safe? By losing altitude, Jimmy would be sacrificing his main advantage. As long as he stayed precisely on the axis, he and Dragonfly would be completely weightless. He could hover effortlessly, or even go to sleep if he wished. But as soon as he moved away from the central line around which Rama spun, the pseudo-weight of centrifugal force would reappear. And so, unless he could maintain himself at this altitude, he would continue to lose height, and at the same time, to gain weight. It would be an accelerating process, which could end in catastrophe. The gravity down on the plane of Rama was twice that in which Dragonfly had been designed to operate. Jimmy might be able to make a safe landing. He could certainly never take off again. But he had already considered all this, and he answered confidently enough. I can manage a tenth of a G without any trouble, and she'll handle Keep more right easily in denser and air. Continue straight on. In a slow, leisurely spiral, Dragonfly drifted across the sky. On roughly following the line of stairway Alpha down toward the plane. From some angles, the little sky bike was almost invisible. Jimmy Keep seemed to be sitting in mid-air, pedaling furiously. Sometimes he moved in spurts of up to 30 kilometers an hour. Then turn he would left. coast to a halt, getting the feel of the controls, 
before accelerating again. And he was always careful to keep a safe distance from the curving face of Rama. It was soon obvious that Dragonfly handled much better at lower altitudes. She no longer rolled around at any angle, but stabilized so that her wings were parallel to the plane seven kilometers below. Jimmy completed several wide orbits, then started to climb upward again. He finally halted a few meters above his waiting colleagues and realized a little belatedly that he was not quite sure how to land his gossamer craft. Shall we throw you a rope? Norton asked half seriously. No, Skipper. I've got to work this out myself. I won't have anyone to help me at the other end. He sat thinking for a while, then started Keep to right. ease Dragonfly toward right. the hub with short bursts of power. She quickly lost momentum between each as air drag brought her to Stand rest right. again. When he was only five meters away and the sky bike was still barely moving, Jimmy abandoned ship. He let himself float toward the nearest safety line in the hub webwork, grasped it, then swung around in time to catch the approaching bike with his hands. The maneuver was so neatly executed that it drew a round of applause. For my next act, Joe Calvert began. Jimmy was quick to disclaim any credit. That was messy, he said. But now I know how to do it. I'll take a sticky bomb on a 20-meter line. Then I'll be able to pull myself in wherever I want to. Give me your wrist, Jimmy, ordered the doctor. And blow into this bag. I'll want a blood sample, too. Did you have any difficulty in breathing? Only at this altitude... Hey, what do you want the blood for? Sugar level, so I can tell how much energy you've used. We've got to make sure you can carry enough fuel for the mission. By the way, what's the endurance record for sky biking? Two hours, 25 minutes, 3.6 seconds. On the moon, of course. A two-kilometer circuit in the Olympic Dome. And you think you can keep it up for six hours? Easily, since I can stop for a rest at any time. Sky biking on the moon is at least twice as hard as it is here. Okay, Jimmy. Back to the lab. I'll give you a go, no go, as soon as I've analyzed these samples. I don't want to raise false hopes, but I think you can make it. A large smile of satisfaction spread across Jimmy's ivory-hued countenance. As he followed Surgeon Commander Ernst to the airlock, he called back to his companions. Hands off, please. I don't want anyone putting his fist through the wings. I'll see to that, Jimmy, promised the commander. Dragonfly is off limits to everybody, including myself. 26. The Voice of Rama The real magnitude of his adventure did not hit Jimmy Pack until he reached the coast of the Cylindrical Sea. Until now, he had been over known territory. Barring a catastrophic structural failure, he could always land and walk to back left. to base in a few hours. That option no longer existed. If he came down in the sea, he turn would probably left. drown, quite unpleasantly, in its poisonous waters. And even if he made a safe landing on the southern continent, it might be impossible to rescue him before Endeavor had to break away from Rama's sunward orbit. He was also acutely aware that the foreseeable disasters were the ones most unlikely to happen. The totally unknown region over which he was flying might produce any number of surprises. Suppose there were flying creatures here who objected to his intrusion. He would hate to engage in a dogfight with anything larger than a pigeon. A few well-placed pecks could destroy Dragonfly's aerodynamics. Yet, if there were no hazards, there would be no Go achievement, on, no sense of adventure. Millions of men would gladly have traded places with him now. 
he was going, not only where no one had ever been before, but also where no one would ever go again. In all of history, he would be the only human being to visit the southern regions of Rama. Whenever he felt fear brushing against his mind, he could remember that. He had now grown accustomed to sitting in mid-air with the world wrapped around him. Because he had dropped two kilometers below the central axis, he had acquired a definite sense of up and down. The ground was only six kilometers below, but the arch of the sky was ten kilometers overhead. The city of London was hanging up there near the zenith. New York, on the other hand, was the right way up, directly ahead. Dragonfly, said Hub Control, you're getting a little low. 2,200 meters from the axis. Thanks, he replied. I'll gain altitude. Let me know when I'm back at 20. This was something he'd have to watch. There was a natural tendency to lose height, and he had no instruments to tell him exactly where he was. If he got too far away from the zero gravity of the axis, he might never be able to climb back to it. Fortunately, there was a wide margin for error, and there was always someone watching his progress through a telescope at the hub. He was now well out over the sea, pedaling along at a steady 20 kilometers an hour. In five minutes, he would be over New York. Already, the island looked rather like a ship, sailing forever round and round the cylindrical sea. When he reached New York, he flew a circle over it, stopping several times so that his little TV camera could send back steady, vibration-free images. The panorama of buildings, towers, industrial plants, power stations, or whatever they were, was fascinating, but essentially meaningless. No matter how long he stared at its complexity, he was unlikely to learn anything. The camera would record far more details than he could possibly assimilate, and one day, perhaps years hence, some student might find in them the key to Rama's secrets. After leaving New York, he crossed the other half of the sea in only 15 minutes. Though he was not aware of it, he had been flying fast over water, but as soon as he reached the south coast, he unconsciously relaxed, and his speed dropped by several kilometers an hour. He might be in wholly alien territory, but at least he was over land. As soon as he had crossed the great cliff that formed the sea's southern limit, he panned the TV camera completely around the circle of the world. Beautiful, said Hub Control. This will keep the map makers happy. How are you feeling? I'm fine. Just a little fatigue, but no more than I expected. How far do you make me from the pole? 15.6 kilometers. Tell me when I'm at 10. I'll take a rest then. And make sure I don't get low again. I'll start climbing when I've five to go. Twenty minutes later, the world was closing in upon him. He had come to the end of the cylindrical section and was entering the southern dome. He had studied it for hours through the telescopes at the other end of Rama and had learned its geography by heart. Even so, that had not fully prepared him for the spectacle all around him. In almost every way, the southern and northern ends of Rama differed completely. Here was no triad of stairways, no series of narrow, concentric plateaus, no sweeping curve from hub to plain. Instead, there was an immense central spike, more than five kilometers long, extending along the axis. Six smaller ones, half the size, were equally spaced around it. The whole assembly looked like a group of remarkably symmetrical stalactites hanging from the roof of a cave, or, inverting the point of view, the spires of some Cambodian temple 
set at the bottom of a crater. Linking these slender, tapering towers and curving down from them to merge eventually in the cylindrical plain were flying buttresses that looked massive enough to bear the weight of a world. And this, perhaps, was their function, if they were indeed the elements of some exotic drive units, as had been suggested. Jimmy approached the central spike cautiously, stopped pedaling while he was still a hundred meters away, and let Dragonfly drift to rest. He checked the radiation level and found only Rama's very low background. There might be forces at work here that no human instruments could detect, but that was another unavoidable risk. What can you see? Hub Control asked anxiously. Just big horn. It's absolutely smooth, no markings, and the point's so sharp you could use it as a needle. I'm almost scared to go near it. He was only half joking. It seemed incredible that so massive an object should taper to such a geometrically perfect point. Jimmy had seen collections of insects impaled upon pins, and he had no desire for his own dragonfly to meet a similar fate. He pedaled slowly forward until the spike had flared out to several meters in diameter and stopped again. Opening a small container, he rather gingerly extracted a sphere about as big as a baseball and tossed it toward the spike. As it drifted away, it played out a barely visible thread. The sticky bomb hit the smoothly curving surface and did not rebound. Jimmy gave the thread an experimental twitch, then a harder tug. Like a fisherman hauling in his catch, he slowly wound Dragonfly across to the tip of the appropriately christened Big Horn until he was able to put out his hand and make contact with it. I suppose you could call this some kind of touchdown, he reported to Hub Control. It feels like glass, almost frictionless and slightly warm. The sticky bomb worked fine. Now I'm trying the mic... Let's see if the suction pad holds as well. Plugging in the leads. Anything coming through? There was a long pause. Then Hub Control said disgustedly, Not a damn thing, except the usual thermal noises. Will you tap it with a piece of metal? Then at least we'll find if it's hollow. Okay. Now what? We'd like you to fly along the spike, making a complete scan every half kilometer, and looking out for anything unusual. Then, if you're sure it's safe, you might go across to one of the little horns, but only if you're certain you can get back to zero G without any problems. Three kilometers from the axis? That's slightly above lunar gravity. Dragonfly was designed for that. I'll just have to work harder. Jimmy, this is the captain. I've got second thoughts on that. Judging by your pictures, the smaller spikes are just the same as the big one. Get the best coverage of them you can with the zoom lens. I don't want you leaving the low gravity region unless you see something that looks very important. Then we'll talk it over. Okay, Skipper, said Jimmy, and perhaps there was just a trace of relief in his voice. I'll stay close to Bighorn. Here we go again. He felt he was dropping straight downward into a narrow valley between a group of incredibly tall and slender mountains. Big Horn now towered a kilometer above him, and the six spikes of the Little Horns were looming up all around. The complex of buttresses and flying arches that surrounded the lower slopes was approaching rapidly. He wondered if he could make a safe landing Somewhere down there in that Cyclopean architecture, he could no longer land on Bighorn itself, for the gravity on its widening slopes was now too powerful to be counteracted by the feeble force of the sticky bomb. As he came ever closer to the South Pole, he began to feel more and more like a sparrow flying beneath the vaulted roof of some great cathedral, 
though no cathedral ever built had been even one hundredth the size of this place. He wondered if it was indeed a religious shrine or something remotely analogous, but quickly dismissed the idea. Nowhere in Rama had there been any trace of artistic expression. Everything was purely functional. Perhaps the Ramans felt that they already knew the ultimate secrets of the universe and were no longer haunted by the yearnings and aspirations that drove mankind. That was a chilling thought, quite alien to Jimmy's usually not very profound philosophy. He felt an urgent need to resume human contact and reported his situation back to his distant friends. Say again, Dragonfly, replied Hub Control. We can't understand you. Your transmission is garbled. I repeat, I'm near the base of Little Horn Number 6 and am using the sticky bomb to haul myself in. Understand only partially. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Repeat, perfectly. Please start counting numbers. One, two, three, four. Got part of that. Give us beacon for 15 seconds, then go back to voice. Here it is. Jimmy switched on the low-powered beacon that would locate him anywhere inside Rama and counted off the seconds. When he went over to voice again, he asked plaintively, What's happening? Can you hear me now? Presumably hub control didn't, because the controller then asked for 15 seconds of TV. Not until Jimmy had repeated the question twice did the message get through. Glad you can hear us okay, Jimmy, but there's something very peculiar happening at your end. Listen. Over the radio, he heard the familiar whistle of his own beacon played back to him. For a moment, it was perfectly normal. Then a weird distortion crept into it. The thousand-cycle whistle became modulated by a deep, throbbing pulse so low that it was almost beneath the threshold of hearing. It was a kind of basso profundo flutter in which each individual vibration could be heard, and the modulation was itself modulated. It rose and fell, rose and fell, with a period of about five seconds. Never for a moment did it occur to Jimmy that there was something wrong with his radio transmitter. This was from outside, though what it was and what it meant was beyond his imagination. Hub control was not much wiser, but at least it had a theory. Keep left. We think you must be in some kind of very intense field, probably magnetic, with a frequency of about 10 cycles. It may be strong enough to be dangerous. Suggest you get out right away. It may be only local. Switch on your beacon again, and we'll play it back to you. Then you can tell when you're getting clear of the interference. Jimmy hastily jerked the sticky bomb loose and abandoned his attempt to land. He swung Dragonfly around in a wide circle, listening as he did so to the sound that wavered in his earphones. After flying only a few meters, he could tell that its intensity was falling rapidly. As hub control had guessed, it was extremely localized. He paused at the last spot where he could hear it, like a faint throbbing deep in his brain. So might a primitive savage have listened in awe-struck ignorance to the low humming of a giant power transformer. And even the savage might have guessed that the sound he heard was merely the stray leakage from colossal energies fully controlled, but biding their time. Whatever this sound meant, Jimmy was glad to be clear of it. This was no place among the overwhelming architecture of the South Pole for a lone man to listen to the voice of Rama. 27. Electric Wind As Jimmy turned homeward, 
The northern end of Rama seemed incredibly far away. Keep Even the three giant stairways were barely visible, as a faint Y etched on the dome that closed the world. The band of the cylindrical sea was a wide and menacing barrier, waiting to swallow him Keep like la. Icarus if his fragile wings should fail. But he had come all this way with no problems, and though he was feeling slightly tired, he now felt that he had nothing to worry about. He had not even touched his food or water, and had been too excited to rest. On the return journey, he would relax and take it easy. He was also cheered by the thought that the homeward trip could be twenty kilometers shorter than the outward one, for as long as he cleared the sea, he could make an emergency landing anywhere in the northern hemisphere. That would be a nuisance, because he would have a long walk, and much worse, would have to abandon Dragonfly, but it gave him a comforting safety margin. He was now gaining altitude, climbing back toward the central spike. Bighorn's tapering needle still stretched for a kilometer ahead of him, and sometimes he felt it was the axis on which this whole world turned. He had almost reached the tip of Bighorn when he became aware of a curious sensation, a feeling of foreboding, and, indeed, of physical as well as psychological discomfort had come over him. He suddenly recalled, and this did nothing at all to help, a phrase he had once come across. Someone is walking over your grave. At first, he shrugged it off and continued his steady pedaling. He certainly had no intention of reporting anything as tenuous as a vague malaise to hub control. But as it grew steadily worse, he was tempted to do so. It could not possibly be psychological. If it was, his mind was much more powerful than he realized, and he could, quite literally, feel his skin beginning to crawl. Now seriously alarmed, he stopped in mid-air to consider the situation. What made it all the more peculiar was the fact that this depressed, heavy feeling was not completely novel. He had known it before, but could not remember where. He looked around him. Nothing had changed. The great spike of Bighorn was a few hundred meters above, with the other side of Rama spanning the sky beyond that. Eight kilometers below lay the complicated patchwork of the southern continent, full of wonders that no other man would ever see. In all the utterly alien, yet now familiar, landscape, he could find no cause for his discomfort. Something was tickling the back of his hand. For a moment he thought an insect had landed there, and brushed it away without looking. He had only half completed the swift motion when he realized what he was doing and checked himself, feeling slightly foolish. Of course, no one had ever seen an insect in Rama. He lifted his hand and stared at it, mildly puzzled, because the tickling sensation was still there. It was then that he noticed that every individual hair was standing straight upright, all the way up his forearm it was the same. And so it was with his head, when he checked with an exploring hand. So that was the trouble. He was in a tremendously powerful electric field. The oppressed, heavy sensation he had felt was that which sometimes precedes a thunderstorm on Earth. The sudden realization of his predicament brought Jimmy near to panic, Never before in his life had he been in real physical danger. Like all spacemen, he had known moments of frustration with bulky equipment and times when, because of mistakes or inexperience, he had wrongly believed he was in a perilous situation. But none of these episodes had lasted more than a few minutes, and usually he was able to laugh at them almost at once. This time there was no quick way out. 
he felt naked and alone in a suddenly hostile sky, surrounded by titanic forces that might discharge their furies at any moment. Dragonfly, already fragile enough, now seemed more insubstantial than the finest gossamer. The first detonation of the gathering storm would blast her to fragments. Hub control, he said urgently. There's a static charge building up around me. I think there's going to be a thunderstorm at any moment. He had barely finished speaking when there was a flicker of light behind him. By the time he had counted ten, the first crackling rumble arrived. Three kilometers. That put it back around the little horns. He looked toward them and saw that every one of the six needles seemed to be on fire. Brush discharges, hundreds of meters long, were dancing from their points, as if they were giant lightning conductors. What was happening back there could take place on an even larger scale near the tapering spike of Bighorn. His best move would be to get as far as possible from this dangerous structure and to seek clear air. He started to pedal again, accelerating as swiftly as he could without putting too great a strain on Dragonfly. At the same time, he began to lose altitude. Even though this would mean entering the region of higher gravity, he was now prepared to take such a risk. Eight kilometers was much too far from the ground for his peace of mind. The ominous black spike of Bighorn was still free of visible discharges, but he did not doubt that tremendous potentials were building up there. From time to time the thunder reverberated behind him, rolling round and round the circumference of the world. It suddenly occurred to Jimmy that it was strange to have such a storm in a perfectly clear sky. Then he realized that this was not a meteorological phenomenon at all. In fact, it might be only a trivial leakage of energy from some hidden source deep in the southern cap of Rama. But why now? And, even more important, what next? He was well past the tip of Bighorn and hoped that he would soon be beyond the range of any lightning discharges. But now he had another problem. The air was becoming turbulent and he had difficulty controlling Dragonfly. A wind seemed to have sprung up from nowhere, and if conditions became much worse, the Skybike's fragile skeleton would be endangered. He pedaled grimly on, trying to smooth out the buffeting by variations in power and movements of his body. Because Dragonfly was almost an extension of himself, he was partly successful but he did not like the faint creaks of protest that came from the main spar, or the way in which the wings twisted with every gust. And there was something else that worried him. A faint rushing okay, sound, guys. How about now? steadily growing in strength, that seemed to come from the direction of Bighorn. Perfect. It sounded like gas escaping from a valve it, under great pressure, and he wondered if it had anything to do with the turbulence he was so battling. So put the microphone Whatever higher. its cause, it gave him yet further grounds for disquiet. From time to time, he reported these phenomena, rather briefly and breathlessly, to hub control. No one there could give him any advice, or even suggest what might be happening. But it was reassuring to hear the voices of his friends, even though he was now beginning to fear that he would never see them again. The turbulence was still increasing. It felt almost as if he was entering a jet stream, which he had once done, in search of a record, while flying a high-altitude glider on Earth. But what could possibly create a jet stream inside Rama? He had asked himself the right question. As soon as he had formulated it, he knew the answer. The sound he had heard was the electric wind carrying away the tremendous ionization that must be building up around Bighorn. Charged air was spraying out along the axis of Rama, 
and more air was flowing into the low pressure region behind. He looked back at that gigantic and now doubly threatening needle, trying to visualize the boundaries of the gale that was blowing from it. Perhaps the best tactic would be to fly by ear, getting as far as possible away from the ominous hissing. Rama spared him the necessity of choice. A sheet of flame burst out behind him, filling the sky. He had time to see it split into six ribbons of fire, stretching from the tip of Big Horn to each of the Little Horns. Then the concussion reached him. 28. Icarus Jimmy had barely time to radio. The wing's buckling. I'm going to crash. When Dragonfly started to fold up gracefully around him, the left wing snapped cleanly in the middle, and the outer section drifted away like a gently falling leaf. The right wing put up a more complicated performance. It twisted around at the root and angled back so sharply that its tip became entangled in the tail. Jimmy felt that he was sitting in a broken kite, slowly falling down the sky. Yet he was not quite helpless. The air screw still worked, and while he had power, there was still some measure of control. He had, perhaps, five minutes in which to use it. Was there any hope of reaching the sea? No, it was much too far away. Keep then he remembered that he was thinking in terrestrial terms. Though he was a good swimmer, it would be hours before he could possibly be rescued, and in that time the poisonous waters would undoubtedly have killed him. His only hope was to come down on land. The problem of the sheer southern cliff he would think about later, if there was any later. He was falling very slowly, here in this tenth of a gravity zone, but would soon start to accelerate as he got farther away from the axis. However, air drag would complicate the situation and would prevent him from building up too swift a rate of descent. Dragonfly, even without power, would act as a crude parachute. The few kilograms of thrust he could still provide might make all the difference between life and death. That was his only hope. Hub had stopped talking. His friends could see exactly what was happening to him and knew that there was no way their words could help. Jimmy was now doing the most skillful flying of his life. It was too bad, he thought with grim humor, that his audience was so small and could not appreciate the finer details of his performance. He was going down in a wide spiral, and as long as its pitch remained fairly flat, his chances of survival were good. His pedaling was helping to keep Dragonfly airborne, though he was afraid to exert maximum power in case the broken wings came completely adrift. And every time he swung southward, he could appreciate the fantastic display that Rama had kindly arranged for his benefit. The streamers of lightning still played from the tip of Bighorn down to the lesser peaks beneath, but now the whole pattern was rotating. The six-pronged crown of fire was turning against the spin of Rama, making one revolution every few seconds. Jimmy felt that he was watching a giant electric motor in operation, and perhaps that was not hopelessly far from the truth. He was halfway down to the plane, orbiting in a flat spiral, when the fireworks display suddenly ceased. He could feel the tension drain from the sky, and knew, without looking, that the hairs on his arms were no longer straining upright. There was nothing to distract or hinder him now, during the last few minutes of his fight for life. Now that he could be certain of the general area in which he must land, he started to study it intently. 
much of this region was a checkerboard of totally conflicting environments, as if a mad landscape gardener had been given a free hand and told to exercise his imagination to the utmost. The squares of the checkerboard were almost a kilometer on a side, and though most of them were flat, he could not be sure if they were solid because their colors and textures varied so greatly. He decided to wait until the last possible minute before making a decision, if indeed he had any choice. When there were a few hundred meters to go, he made a last call to the hub. I've still got some control. We'll be down in half a minute. We'll call you then. That was optimistic, and everyone knew it. But he refused to say goodbye. He wanted his comrades to know that he had gone down fighting, and without fear. Actually, he felt little fear, and this surprised him, for he had never thought of himself as a particularly brave man. It was almost as if he were watching the struggles of a complete stranger, and was not himself personally involved. Rather, he was studying an interesting problem in aerodynamics, and changing various parameters to see what would happen. Almost the only emotion he felt was a certain remote regret for lost opportunities, of which the most important was the forthcoming Lunar Olympics. One future, at least, was decided. Dragonfly would never show her paces on the moon. A hundred meters to go. His ground speed seemed acceptable, but how fast was he falling? And here was one piece of luck. The terrain was completely flat. He would put forth all his strength in a final burst of power, starting now. The right wing, having done its duty, finally tore off at the roots. Dragonfly started to roll over, and he tried to correct by throwing the weight of his body against the spin. He was looking directly at the curving arch of landscape, 16 kilometers away, when he hit. It seemed altogether unfair and unreasonable that the sky should be so hard. 29. First Contact When Jimmy returned to consciousness, the first thing he became aware of was a splitting headache. He almost welcomed it. At least it proved that he was alive. Then he tried to move, and at once a wide selection of aches and pains brought themselves to his attention. But as far as he could tell, nothing seemed to be broken. After that, he risked opening his eyes, but closed them at once when he found himself staring straight into the band of light along the ceiling of the world. As a cure for a headache, that view was not recommended. He was still lying there, regaining his strength and wondering how soon it would be safe to open his eyes when there was a sudden crunching noise from close at hand. Turning his head slowly toward the source of the sound, he risked a look and almost lost consciousness again. Not more than five meters away, a large crab-like creature was apparently dining on the wreckage of poor Dragonfly. When Jimmy had recovered his wits, he rolled slowly and quietly away from the monster, expecting at every moment to be seized by its claws when it discovered that more appetizing fare was available. However, it took not the slightest notice of him. When he had increased their mutual separation to ten meters, he cautiously propped himself up in a sitting position. From this greater distance, the thing did not appear quite so formidable. It had a low, flat body, about two meters long, and one wide, supported on six triple-jointed legs. Jimmy saw that he was mistaken in assuming that it had been eating Dragonfly. In fact, he could not see any sign of a mouth. 
the creature was actually doing a neat job of demolition, using scissor-like claws to chop the sky bike into small pieces. A whole row of manipulators, which looked uncannily like tiny human hands, then transferred the fragments to a steadily growing pile on the animal's back. But was it an animal? Though that had been Jimmy's first reaction, now he had second thoughts. There was a purposefulness about its behavior that suggested fairly high intelligence. He could see no reason why any creature of pure instinct should carefully collect the scattered pieces of his sky bike, unless, perhaps, it was gathering material for a nest. Keeping a wary eye on the crab, which still ignored him completely, Jimmy struggled to his feet. A few wavering steps demonstrated that he could walk, though he was not sure if he could outdistance those six legs. Then he switched on his radio, never doubting that it would still be operating. A crash that he could survive would not even have been noticed by its solid-state electronics. Hub control, he said softly. Can you receive me? Thank God. Are you okay? Just a bit shaken. Take a look at this. He turned his camera toward the crab, just in time to record the final demolition of Dragonfly's wing. What the devil is it? And why is it chewing up your bike? Wish I knew. It's finished with Dragonfly. I'm going to back away in case it wants to start on me. Jimmy slowly retreated, never taking his eyes off the crab. It was now moving round and round in a steadily widening spiral, apparently searching for fragments it might have overlooked, and so Jimmy was able to get an overall view of it for the first time. Now that the initial shock had worn off, he could appreciate that it was quite a handsome beast. The name Crab, which he had automatically given to it, was perhaps a little misleading. If it had not been so impossibly large, he might have called it a beetle. Its carapace had a beautiful metallic sheen. He would almost have been prepared to swear that it was metal. That was an interesting idea. Could it be a robot and not an animal? He stared at the crab intently with this thought in mind, analyzing all the details of its anatomy. Where it should have had a mouth was a collection of manipulators that reminded Jimmy strongly of the multipurpose knives that are the delight of all red-blooded boys. There were pinchers, probes, rasps, and even something that looked like a drill. But this was not decisive. On Earth, the insect world had matched all these tools, and many more. The animal or robot question remained in perfect balance in his mind. The eyes, which might have settled the matter, left it even more ambiguous. They were so deeply recessed in protective hoods that it was impossible to tell whether their lenses were made of crystal or of jelly. They were quite expressionless and of a startling vivid blue. Though they had been directed toward Jimmy several times, they had never shown the slightest flicker of interest. In his, perhaps, biased opinion, that decided the level of the creature's intelligence. An entity, robot or animal, which could ignore a human being, could not be very bright. It had stopped its circling and stood still for a few seconds, as if listening to some inaudible message. Then it set off, with a curious rolling gait, in the general direction of the sea. Keep right, it moved in a perfectly right. straight line, at a steady four or five kilometers an hour, and had already traveled exit. a couple of hundred right. meters before Jimmy's still slightly shocked mind registered the fact that the last sad relics of his beloved dragonfly were being carried away from him. He set off in hot and indignant pursuit. His action 
was not wholly illogical. The crab was heading toward the sea, and if any rescue was possible, it could be only from this direction. Moreover, he wanted to discover what the creature would do with its trophy. That should reveal something about its motivation and intelligence. Because he was bruised and stiff, it took Jimmy several minutes to catch up with the purposefully moving crab. When he had done so, he followed it at a respectful distance until he felt sure that it did not resent his presence. It was then that he noticed his water flask and emergency ration pack among the debris of dragonfly and felt instantly both hungry and thirsty. There, scuttling away from him at a remorseless five kilometers an hour, was the only food and drink in all this half of the world. Whatever the risk, he had to get hold of it. He cautiously closed in on the crab, approaching from the right rear. While he kept station with it, he studied the complicated rhythm of its legs until he could anticipate where they would be at any moment. When he was ready, he muttered a quick, Excuse me, and shot swiftly in to grab his property. Jimmy had never dreamed that he would one day have to exercise the skills of a pickpocket, but he was delighted with his success. He was out again in less than a second, and the crab never slackened its steady pace. He dropped back a dozen meters, moistened his lips from the flask, and started to chew a bar of meat concentrate. The little victory made him feel much happier. Now he could even risk thinking about his somber future. While there was life, there was hope. Yet he could imagine no way in which he could possibly be rescued. Even if his colleagues crossed the sea, how could he reach them half a kilometer below? We'll find a way down somehow, Hub Control had promised. That cliff can't go right around the world without a break anywhere. He had been tempted to answer, Why not? But had thought better of it. One of the strangest things about walking inside Rama was that you could always see your destination. Here, the curve of the world did not hide, it revealed. For some time, Jimmy had been aware of the crab's objective. Up there in the land that seemed to rise before him, was a half-kilometer-wide pit. It was one of three in the southern hemisphere. From the hub, it had been impossible to see how deep they were. All had been named after prominent lunar craters, and he was approaching Copernicus. The name was hardly appropriate, for there were no surrounding hills and no central peaks. This Copernicus was merely a deep shaft, or well, with perfectly vertical sides. When he came close enough to look into it, Jimmy was able to see a pool of ominous, leaden green water at least half a kilometer below. This would put it just about level with the sea, and he wondered if they were connected. Winding down the interior of the well was a spiral ramp, completely recessed into the sheer wall so that the effect was rather like that of rifling in an immense gun barrel. There seemed to be a remarkable number of turns, not until Jimmy had traced them for several revolutions, getting more and more confused in the process, did he realize that there was not one ramp, but three, totally independent and 120 degrees apart. In any other background than Rama, the whole concept would have been an impressive architectural tour de force. The three ramps led straight down into the pool and disappeared beneath its opaque surface. Near the waterline, Jimmy could see a group of black tunnels, or caves. They looked rather sinister, and he wondered if they were inhabited. Perhaps the Ramans were amphibious. As the crab approached the edge of the well, Jimmy assumed that it was going to descend one of the ramps, perhaps taking the wreckage of Dragonfly to some entity who would be able to evaluate it. 
Instead, the creature walked straight to the brink, extended almost half its body over the gulf without any sign of hesitation, though an error of a few centimeters would have been disastrous, and gave a brisk shrug. The fragments of dragonfly went fluttering down into the depths. There were tears in Jimmy's eyes as he watched them go. So much, he thought bitterly, for this creature's intelligence. Having disposed of the garbage, the crab swung around and started to walk toward Jimmy, standing only about ten meters away. Am I going to get the same treatment? He wondered. He hoped the camera was not too unsteady as he showed hub control the rapidly approaching monster. What do you advise? He whispered anxiously, without much hope that he would get a useful answer. It was some small consolation to realize that he was making history, and his mind raced through the approved patterns for such a meeting. Until now, all of these had been purely theoretical. He would be the first man to check them in practice. Don't run until you're sure it's hostile, Hub Control whispered back at him. Run? Where? Jimmy asked himself. He thought he could outdistance the thing in a hundred-meter sprint, but he had a sick certainty that it could wear him down over the long haul. Slowly, Jimmy held up his outstretched hands. Men had been arguing for two hundred years about this gesture. Would every creature, everywhere in the universe, interpret this as, see, no weapons? but no one could think of anything better. The crab showed no reaction whatsoever, nor did it slacken its pace. Ignoring Jimmy completely, it walked straight past him and headed purposefully into the south. Feeling extremely foolish, the acting representative of Homo sapiens watched his first contact stride away across the Raman plain, totally indifferent to his presence. He had seldom been so humiliated in his life. Then his sense of humor came to the rescue. After all, it was no great matter to have been ignored by an animated garbage truck. It would have been worse if it had greeted him as a long-lost brother. He walked back to the rim of Copernicus and stared down into its opaque waters. For the first time, he noticed that vague shapes, some of them quite large, were moving slowly back and forth beneath the surface. Presently, one of them headed toward the nearest spiral ramp, and something that looked like a multi-legged tank started on the long ascent. At the rate it was going, Jimmy decided, it would take almost an hour to get here. If it was a threat, it was a very slow-moving one. Then he noticed a flicker of much more rapid movement near those cave-like openings down by the waterline. Something was traveling swiftly along the ramp, but he could not focus clearly upon it or discern any definite shape. It was as if he was looking at a small whirlwind or dust devil about the size of a man. He blinked and shook his head keeping his eyes closed for several seconds. When he opened them again, the apparition was gone. Perhaps the impact had shaken him up more than he had realized. This was the first time he had ever suffered from visual hallucinations. He would not mention it to hub control. Nor would he bother to explore these ramps, as he had half thought of doing. It would obviously be a waste of energy. The spinning phantom he had merely imagined seeing had nothing to do with his decision. Nothing at all. For, of course, Jimmy did not believe in ghosts. 30. The Flower Jimmy's exertions had made him thirsty and he was acutely conscious of the fact that in all this land there was no water that a man could drink. 
With the contents of his flask, he could probably survive a week. But for what purpose? The best brains of Earth would soon be focused on his problem, and doubtless Commander Norton would be bombarded with suggestions. But he could imagine no way in which he could lower himself down the face of that half-kilometer cliff. Even if he had a long enough rope, there was no place to which he could attach it. Nevertheless, it was foolish Keep and right, unmanly and to right. give up without a struggle. Any help would have to come from the sea, and while he was marching exit. toward it, right. he could carry on with his job as if nothing had happened. No one else would ever observe and photograph the varied terrains through which he must pass, and that would guarantee a posthumous immortality. Though he would have preferred many other honors, that was better than nothing. He was only three kilometers from the sea, as poor Dragonfly could have flown, but it seemed unlikely that he could reach it in a straight line. Some of the terrain ahead of him might prove too great an obstacle. That was no problem, however, because there were plenty of alternative routes. He could see them all, spread out on the great curving map that swept up and away from him on either side. He had plenty of time. He would start with the most interesting scenery, even if it took him off his direct route. About a kilometer away to the right was a square that glittered like cut glass or a gigantic display of jewelry. It was probably this thought that triggered Jimmy's footsteps. Even a doomed man might reasonably be expected to take some slight interest in a few thousand square meters of gems. He was not particularly disappointed when they turned out to be quartz crystals, millions of them set in a bed of sand. The adjacent square of the checkerboard was rather more interesting. It was covered with an apparently random pattern of hollow metal columns Keep set left. close together and ranging in height from less than one to more than five meters. It was completely impassable. Only a tank could have crashed through that forest of tubes. Jimmy walked between the crystals and the columns until he came to the first crossroads. The square on the right was a huge rug or tapestry made of woven wire. He tried to prise a strand loose, but was unable to break it. On the left was a tessellation of hexagonal tiles, so smoothly inlaid that there were no visible joints between them. It would have appeared a continuous surface had the tiles not been colored all the hues of the rainbow. Jimmy spent many minutes trying to find two adjacent tiles of the same color to see if he could then distinguish their boundaries, but he could not find a single example of such a coincidence. As he did a slow pan right around the crossroads, he said plaintively to Hub Control, what do you think this is? I feel I'm trapped in a giant jigsaw puzzle. Or is this the Raman art gallery? We're as baffled as you, Jimmy. But there's never been any sign that the Ramans go in for art. Let's wait until we have some more examples before we jump to any conclusions. The two examples he found at the next crossroads were not much help. One was completely blank. A smooth, neutral gray hard, but slippery to the touch. The other was a soft sponge, perforated with billions upon billions of tiny holes. He tested it with his foot, and the whole surface undulated sickeningly beneath him like a barely stabilized quicksand. At the next crossroads, he encountered something strikingly like a plowed field, except that the furrows were a uniform meter in depth and the material of which they were made had the texture of a file or rasp. But he paid little attention to this, because the square adjacent to it was the most thought-provoking of all that he had seen. At last, there was something that he could understand, and it was more than a little okay, disturbing. Let's find a new route. The entire square was surrounded by a fence, 
so conventional that he would not have looked at it twice had he seen it on Earth. There were posts, apparently of metal, five meters apart, with six strands of wire strung taut between them. Beyond this fence was a second identical one, and beyond that, a third. It was another example of Rama redundancy. Whatever was penned inside this enclosure would have no chance of breaking out. There was no entrance, no gates that could be swung open to drive in the beast or beasts that were presumably kept here. Instead, there was a single hole, like a smaller version of Copernicus, in the center of the square. Even in different circumstances, Jimmy would probably not have hesitated, but now he had nothing to lose. He quickly scaled all three fences, walked over to the hole, and peered into it. Unlike Copernicus, this well was only fifty meters deep. There were three tunnel exits at the bottom, each of which looked large enough to accommodate an elephant. And that was all. After staring for some time, Jimmy decided that the only thing that made sense about the arrangement was for the floor down there to be an elevator. But what it elevated, he was never likely to know. He could only guess that it was quite large and possibly quite dangerous. During the next few hours, he walked more than ten kilometers along the edge of the sea, and the checkerboard squares had begun to blur together in his memory. He had seen some that were totally enclosed in tent-like structures of wire mesh, as if they were giant bird cages. There were others that seemed to be pools of congealed liquid, full of swirl patterns. However, when he tested them gingerly, they were quite solid. And there was one so utterly black that he could not even see it but clearly. Only the sense of touch told him that anything was there. Yet now, there was a subtle modulation into something he could understand. Ranging one after the other toward the south was a series of, no other word would do, fields. He might have been walking past an experimental farm on earth. Each square was a smooth expanse of carefully leveled earth or dirt, the first he had ever seen in the metallic landscape of Rama. The great fields were virgin, lifeless, waiting for crops that had never been planted. Jimmy wondered what their purpose could be, since it was incredible that creatures as advanced as the Ramans would engage in any form of agriculture. Even on Earth, farming was no more than a popular hobby and a source of exotic luxury foods. But he could swear that these were potential farms, immaculately prepared. He had never seen dirt that looked so clean. Each square was covered with a great sheet of tough, transparent plastic. Keep he right, tried to cut through it right. to obtain a sample, but his knife would barely scratch the surface. Exit Farther inland right. were other fields, and on many of them were complicated constructions of rods and wires, left, presumably and intended for the support of climbing plants. They looked bleak and desolate, like turn leafless left. trees in the depths of winter. The winter they had known must have been long and terrible indeed, and these few weeks of light and warmth might be only a brief interlude before it came again. Go straight on. Jimmy never knew what made him stop and look more closely into the metal maze Keep to right, the south. And then turn Unconsciously, right. his mind must have been checking every detail around him. It had noticed, in this fantastically right. alien landscape, something even more anomalous. About a quarter of a kilometer away, in the middle of a trellis of wires and rods, glowed a single speck of color. It was so small and inconspicuous that it was almost at the Get limit of visibility. On Earth, no one would have looked at it twice. Yet undoubtedly, one of the reasons he had noticed it now was because it reminded him of Earth.
He did not report to hub control until he was sure that there was no mistake and that wishful thinking had not deluded him. Not until he was only a few meters away could he be completely sure that life as he knew it had intruded into the sterile, aseptic world of Rama. Here, blooming in lonely splendor at the edge of the southern Get hemisphere, was a flower. As he came closer, it was obvious to Jimmy that something had gone wrong. There was a turn hole left. in the sheathing that, presumably, protected this layer of dirt from contamination right. by unwanted life forms. Through this break extended a green stem, about as thick as a man's little finger, which twined its way up through the trellis work. A meter from the ground, it burst into an efflorescence of bluish leaves, shaped more like feathers than the foliage of any plant known to Jimmy. The stem ended, at eye level, in what he had first taken to be a single flower. Now he saw, with no surprise at all, that it was actually three flowers tightly packed together. The petals were brightly colored tubes about five centimeters long. There were at least fifty in each bloom, and they glittered with such metallic blues, violets, and greens that they seemed more like the wings of a butterfly than anything in the vegetable kingdom. Jimmy knew practically nothing about botany, but he was puzzled to see no trace of any structures resembling pistils or stamens. He wondered if the likeness to terrestrial flowers might be a pure coincidence. Perhaps this was something more akin to a coral polyp. In either case, it would seem to imply the existence of small, airborne creatures to serve either as fertilizing agents or I've as seen. food. It did not really matter. Whatever the scientific definition, to Jimmy, this was a flower. The strange miracle, the un like accident of its existence here reminded him of all that he would never see again, and he was determined to possess it. That would not be easy. It was more than ten meters away, separated from him by a lattice work made of thin Sandra. rods. They formed a cubic pattern, repeated over and over, less than forty centimeters on a side. Jimmy would not have been flying sky bikes unless he had been slim and wiry, so he knew he could crawl Get through the interstices of the grid. But getting out again might be quite a different matter. It would certainly be impossible for him to turn, turn around, so he would have to retreat backward. Hub Control was delighted with his Get discovery when he right. had described the flower turn and scanned right. it from every available angle. There was no objection when he said, I'm going after it. Nor did he expect there to be. His life was now his own, to do with as he pleased. Keep he stripped left, off all his clothes, grasped the smooth metal rods, and started to wriggle into the framework. It was a tight fit. Turn he felt left. like a prisoner escaping through the bars of his cell. When he had inserted himself completely into the lattice, he tried backing out again, just to see if there were any problems. It was considerably more Go difficult, since he now had to use his outstretched arms for pushing instead of pulling, but he saw no reason why he should get helplessly trapped. Jimmy was a man of action and impulse, not of introspection. As he squirmed uncomfortably along the narrow corridor of rods, he wasted no time asking himself just why he was performing so quixotic a feat. He had never been interested in flowers in his whole life, yet now he was gambling his last energies to collect one. It was true that this specimen was unique and of enormous scientific value, but he really wanted it because it was his last link with the world of life and the planet of his birth. Yet when the flower was within his grasp, he had sudden qualms. 
Perhaps it was the only flower that grew in the whole of Rama. Was he justified in collecting it? If he needed any excuse, he could console himself with the thought that the Ramans themselves had not included it in their plans. It was obviously a freak, growing ages too late or too soon. But he did not really require an excuse, and his hesitation was only momentary. He reached out, grasped the stem, and gave a sharp jerk. The flower came away easily enough. He also collected two of the leaves before starting to back slowly through the lattice. Now that he had only one free hand, progress was extremely difficult, even painful, and he soon had to pause to regain his breath. It was then that he noticed that the feathery leaves were closing, and the headless stem was slowly unwinding itself from its supports. As he watched, with a mixture of fascination and dismay, he saw that the whole plant was steadily retreating into the ground, like a mortally injured snake crawling back into its hole. I've murdered something beautiful, Jimmy said to himself. But then Rama had killed him. He was only collecting what was his rightful due.